All right, friends, it is time to go. We're going to get going. It is awesome, first of all, to have you all here today. The first thing I always do is uh, I ask where you are today, and y'all are already doing that. Um, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I saw I have a neighbor here um, who flipped through the, uh, the deal a minute ago uh, through the chat. Uh, great to have all of you. Um, we even have somebody from Dunder Mifflin. It's granted. Awesome. So great. Um, and so what we're doing, guys, is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start today's webinar. And I'm going to talk to you about how it's going to go because we've got some people asking some questions. Have no worries. And uh, then we're going to do some quick introductions in just a second from uh, some various people who are on today's call, on today's webinar. So go ahead. Uh, if you are here, if you have Onyx installed, go ahead and open it just so it's there on a different screen. So you can follow along as you watch, if possible. If not, just watch. No worries. Um, but it's better when you interact. And um, we're going to get going now. So today, just the basic gist, if we were to put it down in a couple points, what we're going to cover throughout today's webinar are the basics of the Onyx hardware. Then we're going to cover the Onyx software. We're going to learn the basics in detail. So how this is going to differ from previous webinars that we've done, like in the spring last year, you might remember, it, maybe you were on some of those webinars uh, where we would do an Onyx 101. This is a little bit different. We're sticking to the base level, but we're going deep into detail. We're talking a lot more today about the why. We're talking a lot more about programming philosophies, about things like that. And most importantly, we are going to have more time to take questions. Now, as we get started here, uh, let's start off with some quick introductions here. So as mentioned, I'll go and pop on here. I'm David Henry from Learn Stage Lighting. Um, and that would be a good time as any for introductions. So we also have here Matthias Henricks, product manager at Elation Professional. Yes, I ripped that photo from your, uh, your Facebook. You want to uh, pop in a second, Matthias? Let me stop the screen share. Whoop, there he is. Hi there. Thanks uh, to everyone for joining us today here. Um, new year, maybe better luck like this year. We'll have uh, four webinars scheduled for you in the next uh, two weeks. So today we do beginner and on Thursday, we're going to do intermediate. Next week we do advanced and the uh, next Thursday, we're going to focus for three hours actually on dialers and going to go through this uh, really amazing pixel engine that we've designed. We are running this uh, webinar on our beta software 4.5. Uh, you all should have received uh, download links, installation, content, lots of goodies, the matching um, capture presentation file. I hope all of you are sort of sitting ready uh, to utilize this. I'll be monitoring uh, Facebook, I'll be monitoring the chat uh, for any quick um, you know, support issues coming in. There's somebody having questions about that. So I'm going to be quiet most of this webinar. I may chime in here or there with a little comment. Um, for David, uh, use the Q&A on the bottom. You know, I think you're going to mention that in a bit anyway. Will, so yeah, uh, yeah. use the Q&A section rather than the chat uh, because chat, it just flies through. Uh, the Q&A allows us to quickly uh, have like pending uh, questions and then we'll we'll get to them when it's appropriate or I may answer a couple of them also uh, while David talks about it. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Minneapolis. It's uh, somewhat snowy outside today so if you're in the sun somewhere enjoy it and yeah thanks David really for, for helping us uh, putting these together and we have a lot of participants today which is really great to see so we should have a good three hours thanks guys awesome, awesome. we also have here uh, Bob Mentel today vertical market manager for Elation as well as the other companies uh, you want to say anything quick Bob sure thanks everybody for joining us it's great to have these again um, a little bit more different format uh, than what we did last time but I think these are going to be super helpful for all those users out there. Um, I also wanted to uh, kind of highlight some different things we're trying to do with everybody's downtime right now. If uh, you guys didn't see, we had the House of Worship design virtual design competition, and we chose three finalists, all three great designs. If any of the three finalists are on here, thanks for joining us. But um, Feel free to check that out. Make sure you vote for the design that you think is the best and watch out for other 
uh, design competitions coming as well. Um, we're hoping to do some more, or at least I am. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, we're hoping to do some more and uh, allow you guys to kind of get out your creative, uh, ju work your creative juices flowing while we're all kind of still eagerly waiting to get back out into the real world. So um, happy to help uh, or happy to join on this webinar. Uh, Matthias and I uh, help with, um, with uh, Onyx support. So you may talk to me every once in a while if you ping in a question to our support email. And if you ever have any capture questions, I help with the capture side of things for Elation as well. So uh, feel free to, uh, to ping me with any capture questions you may have. Uh, related to that too. But thank you again, everyone for joining us and have a great training session. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. And I'm going to go ahead and pop back real quick to the slides because we got some really more. quick here. A question that came in already, um, which has been coming in over Facebook for a couple of days too, is if is this going to be recorded and made available? And the answer is yes, we're going to record all four of them. We'll do quick little edits and uh, put them online as soon as we can. So you have a way to recap maybe before the next one starts. So we're gonna try our best. Um, have to see if uh, there's any technical issues uploading them or converting them, but we'll try to get them up as soon as we can. And then we hope that these four webinars, which is gonna be a total of 12 hours, uh, is gonna be a really nice additional way for people to get into Onyx and really have a another study guide in addition to the Onyx 101 and all the existing training files we have on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you as well. Thank you for that, uh, Matthias. And so, yeah, just real quick, this is uh, Bob. We talked to him for a minute. He is definitely the best dressed man in lighting. Um, no doubts he makes us all look terrible and uh, we're glad to have him here. So, um, I want to know real quick, as, as we get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about the webinar format a little more than, than we already did. Um, and um, how do I get rid of that question? I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but I would love to know in the chat, what type of lighting do you most often work with? What type of lighting do you most often work with? Let us know in the chat. Um, just because that way we can keep that in mind as we go through today's webinar. Sure, right now there's 169 of you in here. We're not going to personally cover everybody's specific needs, uh, you know, <laughs> but we will get to as much as we can. Um, and so, I mean, I wonder how we can get rid of that question that uh, Matias said he would answer live. I don't know. Um, either way, great to see that. Uh, we've got a good mix of people in there. Thanks, Matias, for clearing that question out. Um, so today's webinar, as you're typing that, I'm reading your answers. This is great. Um, we have basically got, you know, we're in Zoom here. This is a Zoom webinar, which is different than a Zoom meeting. So we're not going to see or hear you on the screen. Uh, only the three of us are here. But we are here for you. And this is somewhat interactive, not like a, you know, Zoom meeting because you don't want to have 200 people on a Zoom meeting. That's just, <laughs> that sounds like a disaster. But uh, on, a, on a webinar, we can. And so what we ask from you is if you have a question, hit the Q&A spot, use the Q&A for questions. If you're just chatting or whatever, or saying thanks, put it in the chat section, okay? Don't put that in the Q&A. And the reason why, as Matthias noted, is the Q&A sticks around. They don't get lost in the chat. We won't miss your question. We can mark it off when we're done. And also, a lot of times, people come in and they get a question, and it's a good question, but we're about to cover it anyways. So, uh, that just helps us to stay on top of it to make sure we're not getting distracted and thinking of which, here's what I need you to do. So we're going to be enjoying this webinar today. Uh, we're going to be enjoying each other's company, being apart, but together for the next three hours. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a ton of fun. Uh, what I do need you to do is cut out distractions. Um, I have no problem if questions come up that were already well covered um, and somebody wasn't paying attention. I have no problem saying, hey, we covered that earlier. Check out the replay. Um, and so I don't want you to miss anything pertinent because that would stink, right? And, and so if you can, as best you can, remove distractions. You know, I've got the door shut. I've got uh, my phone off. I would ask you to do the same if you can. That would be a huge help to us so that uh, we don't try to or have to uh, get requested rather to cover anything twice. So let's talk about Onyx hardware, okay? And we're gonna go into a little bit more detail here. I promise we're gonna get to the software in just a few minutes. Um, but 
uh, to tell you the truth, uh, a lot of people, even if you're an Onyx user, even if you use one of the consoles or whatever, you might not be familiar with all the options of hardware that there are for Onyx. You, you just might not be. And there's a lot of good stuff in there that you might not be aware of. So we're just going to go over all of them real quick here. Um, it is worth noting as well that these uh, pictures as well as the information is all available at obsidiancontrols.com. Uh, you could see all of that there. So first and foremost, when we look at the Onyx, Onyx product line, I'll just try to jump step on all my words there. Um, we've got the NX4. And at this point in time, it is the top console. And I got to tell you, if you, the, the Cliff's Notes on the NX4 is if you look at the feature set, you look at the capabilities, you look at the number of faders and the ease of use of the NX4, and um, you compare it to other consoles in its price range, it blows them away. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to me how much is packed into this thing, and they've done a really killer job. Just to highlight a few things, the, the 10 main faders in the middle, yes, they are motorized, which the great thing about that is you then have the LCD screens with the labels on. So it's not like a motorized fader where you still have to tape labels. And so if you got multiple pages, uh, multiple banks, right, you know, you're trying to keep track of it or something, um, it's, it's keeping track for you and it's all digital, right? You open up a new show file, boom, labels are there. Um, we've also got this section in the middle here, which is buttons. And these playback buttons have LCDs in the middle too. So they've got pages and the pages, you know, you're going to see the labels change as you change your page. So you always know when you're about to hit the thing, as long as you look down on it, you know what you're hitting um, and, and you're not confused. Okay. Um, and uh, so then uh, we've also got, of course, the programming section, uh, extra function keys in the middle, the uh, little LCD touch screen, as well as the main touch screen. Uh, and some other things that you might not notice at first glance are the side encoders on the side of the screen here, where you can reach up and, and get additional controls there. We'll show you where they are in the software in a few minutes. And uh, also, of course, there's these sub, -back, sub playbacks right here, which are uh, just more playbacks, not motorized, but still very capable and great for a lot of things. Um, and great console, great layout, a lot of good stuff. Also, the desk lamps that come with it uh, are RGB, so you can have fun with them. Next, we have the NX2. Uh, a lot of similar looks to it, a little bit different functionality. Um, honestly, you know, I think, uh, you know, just when I look at the console market, which I spend a lot of time doing, uh, just dollar for dollar, you know, the, the, if you look at other consoles from other brands that have 10 faders and encoder wheels and a touch screen, um, you really get a lot out of this for the price. And so you got the 10 faders. They're not motorized on the NX2. Um, you've got the programming section, the little touch screen, the big touch screen, the same desk lamp, um, all of that. Both of them have 64 universes licensed. Um, the NX2 can be connected to a PC, however, in a USB mode. And you can get the full 128 Onyx universes. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. Um, it's light, it's compact, it's very easy to, to grab. I mean, both of these really, you know, the NX4 even, you can pick up with one person. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have a buddy, but it's not overbearing for one person, just to give you some perspective there. The two, very easy to carry around as one person. Um, the wing, our next stop is a PC wing. So you plug this in to your PC, use it with the Onyx software. Um, basically has the same features, you know, physical layout as the NX2 with uh, 10 non-motorized faders, but the Grandmaster's separate. So I do note that compared to other consoles on the market where you have to make one of your faders the Grandmaster. I know that's a thing on other consoles. Not the case here. You've got a Grandmaster as a dial, which is super cool. Plus it goes up to 11. Sorry about hitting my microphone. Um, and you can't argue with that. Um, next, we've got the NX Touch. This for me, guys, is, um, you know, I, I mean, I think... Uh, I really appreciate these guys and how much value they they shove into all the hardware. But this is such a good value of a USB controller just because it's a USB-based wing. It's real inexpensive compared to anything else in the market. And the only caveat to it is that the faders are a what they call a force touch fader. So it's not like a traditional fader. It feels a little bit different. But I think you find that once you get used to it, um, they're perfectly usable for applications where budget's a really big concern. 
Um, it, they're, they're a great unit. They're really fun to program with, really fun to play things back. Uh, you get the 10 faders. But then on the right here, these four faders, these are actually your encoder belts in the software. And so you not only do you get a 10 fader playback wing uh, for the cost of the NX Touch, but you also get a small programming section. You know, is it going to change your world? Is it going to be as quick and efficient as an NX wing uh, programming wise? Well, no, you don't have all the keypad and all the function keys and stuff, but it's very capable as it is. And for the price, I mean, gosh, you just can't beat the thing. It's awesome. Uh, there is a rack mount kit for it as well, which includes the rack mount. And you may notice that the connections come out of the side on the right side of the touch. And uh, the rack mount kit has adapters to be able to route those uh, appropriately. Next, we have the NX key. Not much to look at, but it is a USB key. Unlocks the full 128 universes of output from Onyx. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. And uh, fits on a key ring, works real great. Not a lot more to say there. I mean, it's a, it's a nice design. Um, and we've got the NX DMX. Now, the NX DMX is a simple plug it in USB device that has two DMX output on it. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and answer. I see a couple hardware questions coming in. I'll answer those in a second. Um, and, and it allows you to use a PC to be able to uh, get those two universes of output for you know the lowest price out of all this hardware we've talked about so far. Uh, we also have an education version. That's right, Elation offers an education program. If you are a student or a faculty at a, uh, a institution and you can prove it, then uh, that you can get with Elation and they will uh, give you a special price on the NX DMX for education. I can tell you, it's a really good price. Um, so that's just a way to help support the education, help uh, people to see and try Onyx in, in that world and to be able to do so for a great price. Then we have the, the uh, then we have the NX Sync, okay? Um, remember guys, if you have questions, put them in the questions section. Not that I'm watching the chat because I said I wouldn't. Um, but the NX Sync is a time code interface. So it looks a lot like the NX DMX box. And, you know, physically it is, but this is a time code interface for linear time code for, you know, time code that's audible through an XLR port uh, for SMPTE. And so if you have those needs and you want to get it into a PC um, or a console, you can use the NX Sync. Well, a console that doesn't have the ports, but most of them do. Um, the new ones all do. So that's the NX Sync. Then we also have the Netron hardware, okay? So the Netron hardware is separate from the Onyx line, um, but it is DMX output nodes and also uh, DMX splitters. So a variety of DMX output devices, um, nothing on the Netron line is going to unlock output for you, but they all certainly can be used with Onyx and they do a great job there, okay? So be sure to check those out as well. There's some great options. And honestly, like I was talking to Matthias the other day and you've got things like the EN12, or uh, even the EP4, you know, both of those guys are not only easy to use, not only have a cool software interface that works really well, but the pricing on them compared to other similar options is really good. So if you haven't checked that stuff out, you know, maybe it hadn't been on your radar because it hasn't been out as long as other products on the market, um, do give those a look as well next time you need a node. Let's talk about the Onyx software, guys. All right, and then we'll get into uh, the licensing, the questions uh, that are coming up about hardware, et cetera. Um, so the Onyx software, the cool thing about Onyx, I like the software because it's designed for the touchscreen. They've really put a lot of effort into it to make it work on a touchscreen and make it work well. So that from a PC to a console, it's the same experience. It's not like it looks different. And if you're just on a PC and you only have a screen, um, hopefully a touch screen, we'll get to that in a second, then you can still work really well within the software. Um, it doesn't feel like you have to constantly pull up like a funny, you know, command uh, wing, you know, area or, you know, all these, all these different keys and stuff. And you don't have to bring up a big piece of a window with faders like a lot of other consoles. Um, the, the software really is designed well for those PCs and also all the way to the console, it works amazing uh, for a lot of things. You can use it on the touch screen. You can use the, the command keys. You can use a combination of the two and get great results with your lighting. You can get four free universes out 
of Onyx via SACN and or ArtNet um, and or USB devices. And you can get full OSC control. We'll talk about this a little bit. Full OSC control with the NX Touch Onyx key and consoles. Uh, also, there is the Capture Visualizer, which we're going to use a demo show today. Uh, we'll get deeper into Capture on Thursday on the next webinar as well. Okay. And, uh, but, but uh, we will, because some of the integrations that are coming out in the next version of Onyx, which we're using the beta of today, are really, really cool. There's some really great stuff going on. Okay. Um, licensing wise, we can see here this chart. It's on the support website, support.obsidiancontrol.com. We'll go over that at the end as well. Uh, it just lets you know, you know, the NX4, four DM exports, 64 universes, same with the NX2, um, but shows you all the caveats about OSC and whatnot. We can answer any specific questions about that. The biggest thing to note is the OSC support is enabled in the NX Touch, the wing and the consoles, um, as well as the key but the NX DMX does not unlock that full OSC functionality. Um, other than that, you're gonna have your touch, your NX DMX and your, um, actually just the NX touch and NX DMX. If you have those connected, you are in PC mode free. And that just means that you can use universes one through four, okay? Um, and you can't use universe numbers higher than that. Um, so that's just something to know as well if you're you know, integrating with an existing install or something that might be a concern, but if not, it's probably not. Now, when it comes to installing Onyx, there are system requirements as with any software. Um, the general gist of this is that uh, these are going to allow you to run Onyx smoothly and do a great job. Um, can you run Onyx on a lesser PC? Technically it won't run. Maybe you use that for you know patching a show ahead of time, but not really using it as a console. Um, but we really do recommend using some, some computer that does meet the system requirements when running shows. Um, ultimately, you know, if you're not using something, if you're using something that doesn't meet the system requirements and then something goes wrong, you know, we can't really help you, right? The Onyx team can't really, you know, <laughs> help you in that case. So pay attention to these uh, if you're using it on shows, of course, and not just playing around at home on it or um, in the office, but um, that's important to know as well. Awesome. So I see a bunch of questions coming in. And so we're going to go is, um, we're going to go ahead and answer a lot of the questions that came in. Remember to answer your questions in the question section um, and not in the chat, the Q&A section, not the chat. Very important because I've seen a number of questions come in via the chat and they just go away. Uh, you want to answer these, Matthias? Yeah, I'm just going to answer them in the Q&A box as they come in, because some of them are not really related to this webinar. So I'll, I'll go over them. Awesome. In a second. You just continue on. Great. The one note I did see that I don't have on here, somebody said, what about an Android app for remote control? Um, so there is an iOS app for remote, um, which does work well. It gives you an interesting interface. It doesn't look anything like the console itself. It's, it's kind of designed for that type of screen. Um, but if you have OSC fully unlocked, you can use the Touch OSC app. Um, even if you don't have OSC fully unlocked, um, OSC delays the playbacks. So you can still technically use the Touch OSC app with the OSC layout to use all of the programming keys. Actually, none of the programming is delayed. So you can still yes. use the Touch OSC to do all the remote programming, just no yes. programming. Yep, exactly. That's, yep, that's what I was saying. So yeah, um, so yeah, absolutely. You're, you can do all your programming stuff, press all those keys, you know, totally do that. Um, the playbacks just are delayed um, unless you have a device that unlocks them. Awesome. So Matthias is going to go, those of you that have asked other questions so far, uh, he's going to answer those in the chat. And so hopefully you're understanding that, um, you know, um, there's some specific questions about uh, specifically older hardware and how it's compatible or not with the current version of Onyx. And uh, that doesn't apply to most of you. So Matthias will answer those individually. Awesome. So let's take a step back here. And uh, great to have uh, all of you here today. Why take the time to attend a webinar like we're having today? Okay. Um, a webinar like today, 
we're we're starting from the start and we're covering the basics and really going into depth with Onyx is really great whether you're just starting from scratch or whether you've been using Onyx for a while. You know, the thing that I love about Onyx and the thing that I, I continue to learn about it all the time is that Onyx has an immense amount of depth to it. And there's often multiple ways to accomplish really similar tasks that you may not know. And the more you take time to learn, especially now as things are shut down and, and you may have, uh, you may have um, more time on your hands, you know, there's no reason not to invest in yourself because when events start coming back and we hope they start coming back soon, um, the better you are, the quicker you program, the more efficient you are, um, not only is it going to make your life less stressful, but it's going to make your shows better. Um, I am, you know, personally like the kind of person who's like, hey, let's keep it as simple as possible, you know, make a great show for our clients. But I recognize that taking that time to learn different functions in the console, to learn different ways to do things, to learn little tricks I didn't know, um, they're really going to help me in the future. And they do help me whenever I learn to do those. And so that's why I recommend checking these out, even though today, you know, today's basics, but we're going to really get in depth. And then over the next webinars, we're going to cover even more cool and exciting stuff. So let's hop over to the console and we're going to start going. It's going to be great. Okay. Uh -huh. And so, as I mentioned, guys, if you have asked questions, make sure they're in the Q&A section. That might sound like a broken record here. And unless I see a particular question come up a bunch of times, Matthias is getting to those and we appreciate that. And let's hop over to Onyx now. So I'm going to go over there and we are here. We've just started the software. We're not loading anything yet because uh, I want to start from the very basics of Onyx. So when we first get here to Onyx, um, we have a few different options of what to do. Okay, your screen may or may not look exactly like this. So we've got the ability to create a new show. We've got the ability to load a show. We have the ability to join a network show. And then we have the ability to continue the last show we had loaded. So you may or may not see the continue. If this is the first time you've launched Onyx, you're not going to see that. Not a problem. Let's go ahead and create a new show. So I know you guys did download a demo file and we're going to get there. It is no problem. Um, but first we're going to go ahead and create a new show and, and learn how to patch some things, learn how to start from scratch. And then we'll go back, we'll load the show file, et cetera. So we're just going to give this a name and press enter. And then we're going to get a new show. Woo it's that easy. The cool thing about a webinar like today too is, is we're going to get into things. We're going to cover some detail, et cetera. Um, but we're also going to leave more time for you to, to sit there and work in the software if you happen to have it on a different screen uh, from what you're watching this on. You know, time to do things to follow what I'm doing, et cetera. Okay. Um, so we've got this. And then I'm also going to go ahead and load up that capture file. So I'm just going to resize this a little bit, get our capture file here. And now I got this little pop-up that just came up that says CITP, a network device has been identified. Um, don't worry if you're not seeing that. We'll, we'll walk through the setup of the capture file in just a, a minute or two, okay? But before we get there, I want to talk about what we're seeing here, what kind of things are going on here um, within the uh, Onyx system, okay? So the first thing we've got, this is our main screen that you see when you first load Onyx. And maybe you've seen this before and you're like, David, I'm falling asleep. We'll, we'll get to you know other stuff in a minute. Um, but it's important to understand what we've got here. So our main sections here in the middle, we have a lot of different windows. We have a lot of different views, a lot of different things we can bring into here that we can navigate to on this left sidebar. Now, all of these views and such are completely customizable. Um, and we're going to get into that more, not as much today, but uh, on uh, either the next webinar or the one after that. I can look if you, if you were uh, questioning that. Um, and so we've got our main area here. We've got our views on the left. We've got on the right, these are those side screen encoders that I talked about on the NX2 and NX4, as well as the uh, previous M2Go HD and 1HD consoles. Then across the bottom, we've got our playbacks, okay? So we've got our playbacks here, and there are one through 10, which 
are going to be your faders. So if you're on any of the consoles, those are going to be your main faders or the 10 faders that you have in the case of a, an M-Touch or something like that. And then 11 through 20 is generally the buttons to the right of those faders. So just as, as this is laid out here, that's how most of the consoles are laid out. You're going to see that on the NX Touch. You're going to see that on the NX4. Uh, the NX2 doesn't have the buttons, but the 4 does, um, et cetera. Okay. Next, we have across the top a toolbar with a variety of different things on it. So on this toolbar, we have our menu, which is the Onyx symbol and the words. We have our workspace chooser. We'll talk more about that later. We have the ability to hide our, uh, our side bar here. We have a Grandmaster and Flashmaster, which are useful, especially uh, if you are not on a physical console. If you're just on a touch screen, you may want to use those from time to time. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and we have uh, some different deals here to pop up our CV, um, our encoder wheels, our virtual faders, our status. Uh, if we're using Dialos, that will give us information about status of import of videos and things like that. Our chat, but you didn't know your console had a chat, which you can use if you have multiple consoles on the network. It can be fun if you're working a show, you got somebody backstage, it really helps a lot. We've got our question mark, this is great. So you can hit this question mark and many things that you click on in the interface will have a yellow pop-up. And that yellow pop-up is gonna tell you stuff out of the user manual, stuff you might wanna know. Uh, so if you're like, hey, I just wanna know what all the stuff is, I'm not sure uh, what we've got here you're gonna find that there. Then we've got these couple arrows, okay? So these couple arrows are giving us the ability to maximize any of our windows within our view. The left one allows us to maximize it to just the size of the screen with the toolbars. Or if we press it again, we can get the entire window or the entire screen to uh, be filled with that one window. Awesome. Also, we have um, the ability here to, 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 to cover, oh yes. So the, um, the workspaces, cover that real quick. By default, there are four workspaces. We'll go over customizing these uh, in, the, in a future webinar. But we have the ability to switch between some predefined different views and, and settings on our sidebar, okay? So you're able to see a lot of different stuff. They're named thus uh, compose playback DJ and examples. And so these allow you to basically just have, you know, they're just kind of templates, just suggestions of sets of windows that work really well for these different circumstances. You can use them, you don't have to, you can make them go away, you can delete all of them, except the, the you have to always have one, right? So you have some kind of use, but ultimately they're completely customizable. We'll talk more about that. Also here at the bottom, you might have seen these funny little icons here, which are um, new in the beta version of the software that we're in. And uh, they'll be in the software, of course, in the future. The first is this little uh, arrows, which you may be able to see is allowing me to switch my playbacks between one through 10 and 11 through 20. And I believe also um, in the beta, this is actually physically doing it on the consoles. Uh, we also have, this little funny looking faders icon. And the funny little faders icon is like a gift to PC users. Oh my goodness. Um, so this thing is so cool. I was, I was so surprised when I saw this because I, I just hadn't envisioned it before. So what this is, is actually just these little faders with all the playback buttons right here on your touch screen. Um, how stinking awesome is that? So even if you have literally no Onyx hardware, or maybe you just have an Onyx key and you're programming away, you can have 10 faders on here and actually have a little fader on your touch screen, have some buttons and be able to get that control. And so how stinking awesome is that? Now, one thing I've seen as people are asking questions here, I have seen it, uh, the question asked, and there's a keypad on all the way on the, uh, on the left there. I wonder, wonder if I can get it just the right size to see that, but still see capture decent enough. We're gonna find out, probably not, um, but that's okay. Oh, it gets smaller. Can we get the whole thing? Yeah, you need a full size, that's okay. Um, and so there is a, a full keypad right there. And so this is super helpful and honestly a huge gift from the team for PC users. Uh, I think that's awesome. 
Uh, there, so, oh, I was going on the saying, so there's been a number of questions come through about uh, M touches, M plays, will they stay supported in the future, et cetera. And I got to tell you guys, because there's a lot of questions here about that, is they do such a great job at supporting these older um, pieces of hardware. Uh, and as far as I know, unless Matias jumps in and says something else, um, that's going to be the case long into the future. In fact, when they typically discontinue hardware and stop supporting it on Onyx, it's always been historically, as I've watched it, it's always been when that's a physical console that has a processor or has drivers that literally can't be supported by the version of Windows that they're running inside the consoles. Um, so it's not one of those moves, um, like people sometimes accuse sometimes that they're like trying to take away support for old hardware to make you buy new stuff. They really, I, I, in the way that I see when I look at all the different consoles on the market, they support older hardware better than anybody else on the market. Um, and so um, your M touches, your M plays, they should still stay supported for a long time. I've got an M touch here. We might plug in later to look at licensing. Uh, it works great, still works, um, and that's going to be uh, the continuation as far as I know. And uh, they've done, always done a great job of that in the past, which I greatly appreciate. Okay, so all that to say, get off my soapbox for a second. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. A lot of good stuff going on here in the, um, in the software. New stuff, old stuff, so much good stuff. So let's go ahead and get to patching. Um, because ultimately, the first thing you got to do to make a show is you got to patch some lights. You got to tell the console where the lights are and make them work, okay? Um, and so what we're going to do is hit our Onyx menu here, go to patch. I'll grab a quick sip of my tea. And here we have the patch window. Now, tomorrow, um, or tomorrow, in two days on our next webinar, uh, we're going to cover actually importing the patch, this new option import from Capture, which is awesome. It is so cool. So awesome. We're going to work through that whole workflow. Today, however, we're just going to patch some lights regularly. Then I'm going to show you how to set them up with the Capture demo file so we can get control. Um, and so we'll be there in just a second for those who are asking questions about that. Uh, one thing Matthias did note is it can be helpful to you to install the Microsoft Loopback adapter on your Onyx machine uh, for connecting to Capture within the same computer. Um, I have that installed here. Um, it's helpful to have. Oftentimes you can uh, just use your wireless card, but um, sometimes that doesn't work on specific pieces of hardware. For most people it does, but I'm just letting you know that as well. So patching. Patching is where, um, if you haven't, if you're new to this, it's where we tell the console what lights we're going to use. And then we can tell the console, okay, Onyx, I need to patch them at this DMX address. Or maybe you tell Onyx, you know, you put them where you want them <laughs> and, and fill the space, uh, you know, as efficiently, et cetera. Okay, guys, and like I mentioned, we're, we're going to get there to uh, hook up capture, but first we got to patch some things all in good time. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do here is patch a new fixture and we're going to patch the fixtures from the demo file. So we're going to click commands here in blue and new fixture. And then we're going to find our first fixture. So the first one is they are fuse profiles. So first we've got our manufacturer. So we're going to go to D E scroll down till we see elation, which is highlighted, which is very helpful. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to find, what was it again? Fuse profile. So now we go to DEF, fuse profile. Let's see, our mode is CMY mode. And now we will press auto patch. And so now we can configure where we want the console to patch it. So the first thing is you can name these if you'd like. Uh, if you have a particular name for this type of fixture, you can type in the name field what you would name it. Um, for this, we're just going to leave that blank. Just use Fuse Profile CMY as the name. Then we put in the amount. So anytime we see a field like this where we've got our number in the middle and the plus and minus, we can use the, the number, the plus and minus, to increase or decrease the number. 
we can type in here and we can type the amount we want. Say we want 100, we don't want 100. And uh, if you are typing, it needs to be on a keypad. That's where the numbers are in like a square on the right side of your keyboard, not the numbers over top of your keyboard. Or we can double tap and then we get this pop up. And we are going to do 10 of these guys. So we'll enter 10 right there. Then we have the ability to set our fixture ID. Now in the demo file, these are starting out at fixture ID one. Um, I'm not going to rag on Bob Mantel too much. You know, I, I've always been in the school of thought and I, the way I was taught, of course, um, was that you start your first moving light spot at 101, your next one at 201, your next one at 301. And I always put my front light fixture at one. Um, you can do what you want. That is purely your design. But I would say if you haven't set different start IDs than what your console does before, I would go ahead and do something that's sequential. I like the hundreds method because, you know, you never know when you're going to have more than 10 fixtures. Uh, you know, maybe you do smaller scale events right now and you don't often have more than 10 fixtures of one type, but the day's probably going to come where you have 100 fixtures of a certain type. Of course, the fun comes when you get over 100 fixtures of a certain type and then you have to throw that numbering method out the window. But until you hit that point, um, you can totally use the hundreds. Whatever you use, I would say, make it sensible. You know, make it something that makes some sense, that you can think through it and be consistent with it. Because ultimately, whether you're running lights in one place and you work at this venue, this church, whatever it might be, or you're doing different shows every day as a, as a lighting designer once shows come back again, um, having a consistent method and following that method means that even if you just walked into a room and you don't remember where stuff was patched, you can quickly, your knee-jerk reaction, you can look at a light and say, oh, that's the third from the left and it's my wash, that's 303. And you can move so much quicker when you're consistent. So I really recommend doing that. So all that to say, that's the start ID. That's the fixture number, as it's also called sometimes. We also have our universe. So we can set it to the DMX universe. Um, we can set it automatic. That's just going to choose the next available slot that's open. Or we can enter a number in there. Okay. So we can turn auto on and off as need be. We're going to leave it on. Same with the address, works the same. We can we can set the DMX address that we want. We see all this green over here, which lets us know, yay, we're good. We've got space to patch at that address. If we had other fixtures uh -huh, and we chose an address that overlapped with other fixtures, they would show up in red here on the right. We can show you that in a couple seconds. And with address comes footprint. If we increase that, you see we get spaces in between each fixture. And so this is incredibly helpful. If you walk into a venue and you've got to patch their stuff, and like here, I've got a five channel gap. So maybe they had put these moving lights every other DMX address, and in between them, they put a five channel par. You know, maybe it was a RGBW with a master channel or an RGB amber white, you know, LED. And it has five channels, and they went, you know, spot, pit, par, spot, par, spot, par. Um, not only is that really annoying for when people come in, but it, you know, it's kind of a pain in the butt. But with the channel gap, you can you can speed up your patching process by uh, skipping those channels. You won't have to reassign a bunch of stuff later. You're good to go. We'll put that back to automatic, and then we're going to press apply to patch. Right at the top, you're going to see console think, the hardware do some stuff. Depending on your hardware, this could come real fast. This could come real slow. Um, if, but if you have something that meets the specs of Onyx, it should move pretty quickly um, if you're not patching a ton of stuff. And of course, if you're on one of the consoles, it's it's quite quick. Um, so let's go ahead and patch another fixture here to show you a couple more things. This time we're gonna go to commands, new fixture. And we have the ability again to walk through the wizard. And this time we want the fuse SFX standard mode. By the way, this last bit, the DMX channel or the DMX profile, uh, this just allows us to go ahead and see the channels that this particular mode controls. And so this is great if you have a light and you're not sure maybe the name here in the, in the modes doesn't match what you're seeing in your manual, okay? Um, and if that's the case, um, then, then uh, you can go ahead and actually compare the channels right here. Okay, 
and, and make sure that what you've got lines up. Now, if we are looking for a light, there are a few other windows that are within this wizard. So we also have patched types. This will show us the lights that we have in the show already. We have history, okay? So this is gonna show us the last lights we've used. We also have the user library. This is any lights that you've built or modified. And then there's a the search. So you can totally go ahead and search lights too. We'll just type uh, SFX because that's pretty simple. Hit enter. You get a bunch of random stuff there, but also the light we want. And now we can press auto patch. Awesome. So now we're going to go ahead and we are going to set our amount on these to eight. We are going to set the start ID. We'll leave it where it is. Um, I'll answer some questions in a minute. We will set the universe to uh, two this time. And then we will set our channel. We'll leave that in auto to one. Now I had mentioned if we were in universe one and we set the address to one or anything that overlaps, like I'll just set this to 44. Nope, that doesn't give me enough space. 89, 115. Uh... So say I set it and it's overlapping partially or totally other lights that are in there already. Okay. Uh, so what's going to happen there is uh, it's going to show up right here to let you know that that's not capable. And until you switch that to a channel that works, it's not going to show up green. So we'll press apply to patch and then we'll pause and I'll let you guys catch up. So let me know when you guys have done this. We've got those 10 fuse profiles at universe one. And then we've got 11 through 18. We've got uh, eight of these fuse SFX standard mode at universe two. And I'll type that in the chat real quick. And then uh, just give me like a thumbs up in the, uh, or done, yeah, in the chat for a couple, I'll wait for a couple to come through. And then I'll address a couple of the questions that came through and uh, we will go ahead and then move from there. Killer. So people are finishing up. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and answer a couple questions while the rest of you work on uh, finishing this. And uh, so Ivan says, I've got a question regarding a fixture setting up of the library. Do the LD program fixtures or do they usually go by what it's programmed? Um, the reason he's asking is because he showed up at gigs where the fixtures are Chinese and he's not able to set up a fixture since it's not in the library. So Ivan, what you got to do is you do need to find a fixture that matches the channel if you're literally showing up at a gig like and you don't have info ahead of time. If you have info ahead of time, of course, we want to request that fixture from um, Obsidian Controls, which then now goes through uh, the capture team. Um, and so, unfortunately, um, there's not, there used to be a fixture finder, and maybe Matthias, I, I don't know, I know this is a, a tough area that with the old fixture library, there was a finder we could use with the new, there's not, um, where we could compare to fixtures that are in the library, something that we had that was a no name fixture. Um, and so uh, the fixture finder was not provided by us. So I was like, if no yeah. external person that did it as a little hobby that will stay online for now. And it still references the old Onyx library to find comparable fixtures that won't go away. So Correct. it just so, won't get updated any further. Yeah. And that's the thing that's tough. Cause that's such a great tool. If you show up like into a venue and you had no info ahead of time and, and you want to match it up a fixture. Uh, that was something I know I used a good bit. The yeah, problem is that it scanned the entire library and the uh, library that we have now is encrypted. So it can't be cloned and copied anymore. So that is not longer possible. And I get that. Um, and so probably the best solution, unfortunately, is you kind of have to hunt and peck and guess. You know, most often when you have a no-name light, it's going to be somewhat, you know, based off of another light that exists. <laughs> and so I would start there. Uh, but that's going to be the best. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, same with Alibaba had the same question um, about patching a dance floor with no, no brand name. Again, you need something. 
if you've got this information ahead of time as to what the DMX channels are for the fixture, um, then you can submit that, get that profile made, and you'll be good to go. Um, but um, yeah, the uh, just for asking for doing libraries, I'll just show you real quick. If we go to support.obsidiancontrol.com, we go to support on the sidebar or the menu if you're on mobile, and then there's a fixture request link. And for the new library, which is what we're using in the beta right now, it's in the library preview. And then um, there is, uh, it shows you here where all the, all the fixtures in it. You can request it as well through the request form. Um, and it's a different form, but we'll, that'll get consolidated once you're, uh, once we're you know, over to this for a release version, I'm sure. Um, you can make fixtures as well. There is a fixture creator. Um, there is information on how to use that in the manual um, and it can be done. Um, and so it's not, it's, it's not bad to use. Um, it's not super, super easy to use, but it definitely can be done. You can make fixtures. Um, but if you have the time and the information ahead of time, the very best solution is to contact support for help and they make it because then not only is it in there for you, but it's in there for anybody else who runs into it into the future. Awesome. Very cool. Also should mention that the uh, library editor cannot create multi-part fixtures. So you have a fixture with multiple uh, LED cells. The editor is not allowed to, to create those. So those can only be created by our own team because they're pretty complex to do all the multi-part uh, controls, multiple modes. So. But we have, our turnaround time is very quick. And as you said, David, we really encourage people to use the request so our library gets better and more complete and more perfect rather than trying to figure it out yourself. That's what we're here for. So take advantage of that. Yeah, and the thing is, the last thing I have to say about requesting libraries is sometimes people are like, oh, like I don't want to cause them the trouble of requesting that fixture. But here's the thing. If you do it yourself, because I've done it myself before, you're going to create a fixture file that A, takes you a long time, you know, because you have to figure out the fixture editor, then you have to input all your stuff, then you have to test it. Um, and B, um, isn't going to be as good of a fixture profile and is going to be more difficult to control than the one that the team makes for you. It just is. Um, I mean, maybe you're great at these things and that's great for you. But then the third part is like, okay, so you saved yourself you didn't save yourself anything, actually. It took you more time. Um, but you saved, you didn't bother the library team, which you're not bothering them. Um, but then next week or in a month, somebody else is going to run across the thing and they're going to request it anyway. So you might as well save yourself the time. Um, and as people know, the turnaround time is fantastic. I don't like to, um, you know, <laughs> I don't like to make promises, like be like, oh yeah, they're usually made to get around fast, but Matias said it. And I can tell you when I've made requests before, I mean, they're, they're crazy fast. Um, gosh, <laughs> like a day, you know, or less sometimes, which is just nuts to me. Not that that's a promise that they'll always be that fast, but they do really put a priority on being quick and they, they do a great job. Awesome. So I had a question. Uh, somebody did ask, and we'll get there. We'll, we'll answer some patch, you know, kind of uh, troubleshooting type questions. Somebody said, okay, I went in and I only had one of whichever light. I didn't patch, you know, eight or 10 of the other light. Um, how do I do that? Well, if you just did one and you need to add nine more, you can just go through the commands new fixture again. If you've patched two things before, it's going to go to patch types first, um, or you can go back to the standard library. And then you're just going to go into auto patch. You're going to do nine more. Okay. You want to have the start ID after the first one, but we can edit that stuff. Um, it's super easy. Okay. Um, and so that's super easy to do. Say we press these nine applied to patch. Um, just to run through an example, I'm going to clear this out. But say you went ahead and you patched one fuse profile and then you patched, we'll just do it here quick. So you patch one fuse profile and then two through nine were the fuse SFXs and then 10 through 18 were the fuse profiles. Well, you probably just saw there that 
it is completely doable and very easy to move anything around in this. It's, it's just like a spreadsheet. So with reference to the fixture ID number, I could sort by type real quick, highlight here with my touch screen, with my mouse, whatever, these fixtures. I see the command down below, move fixture one plus 10, blah, 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 at. I type one, enter, boom. Those guys are at one. Now it's not gonna take because of course I got something in the way. That's a common problem. And so I'm gonna put these guys at, I think they were at 11. Hey now. Oh, but I already got an 11, so I just need to move these real quick. I'm not paying attention. I shouldn't look at the chat. It's gonna distract you. <laughs> so now we move those to 20, move these guys to two. So now we've got one through nine, and then we can put these at 11, done. Now we're right back, just like we patched them all in order, did everything nice and easy. Not a problem, okay? So we're, we're gonna get to capture, have no worries, guys, all right? Um, while we're here in fixture profiles here, we're actually gonna patch one more fixture and then I'm gonna ask, we're gonna ask Matias about uh, G, DTF and MVR. So we're gonna patch some Fuse Z350s. So go commands, new fixture. This is just for practice. Standard library, Fuse Wattulation, Fuse Wash Z350. We are in RGBW mode. Uh, and it's the 15 channel mode one. We're going to do eight of these. We're going to put them at universe three, address auto and patch those. Awesome. Very cool. So those guys are now patched and happy. I might be in the wrong mode, but that's okay. Cause we're gonna remedy that in a second. And, uh, Matthias, you want to hop in for a minute to talk about GTDF and MVR? Sure, that's very quick. Um, GDTF is something we are not going to require or support for a direct import. The GDTF files that uh, will be provided by the different uh, fixture manufacturers are going to be utilized by our library um, supplier, which is Atlas Base. So they're going to use GDTF as part of their you know, investigation of all the different parameters of the fixture, the gobos, the photometrics, the colors. So GDTF will just be part of that for them to create fixture libraries. Um, but we will not have a direct import of GDTF because our library is way more complex than what GDTF can provide us. And we currently have no um, plans to support MVR. So awesome. yeah, libraries will be, um, the way Atla base works now to maybe also explain this is that it's a proactive um, system. So whatever, Roby just announced a new fixture, Elation will announce a new fixture. Pretty much the day the documentation is out, a day or two later, the fixture is part of our library. Where before the library was a by request system. So there we added the libraries when people asked for it. Now we're part of this big subscription package and the libraries are fully synchronized between Capture and Onyx. And whatever, uh, for instance, user requests something for Capture, automatically that picture will be in the same uh, precision in, in Onyx as well. And that's why we don't really require these GDTF files. Awesome, yeah. And that's, that's a big deal that, because with what's coming up, what's in this beta version and the future releases, the way that Onyx and Capture can work together uh, via CITP, which is an open protocol, uh, the way that they work together, um, it helps make things a lot smoother that they use the same fixture as their base, um, because or else you would have to match up the two from time to time and it could cause issues. And so, and so that is uh, super helpful there. Awesome guys. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and we've put in these Z350s. Clearly I don't have them quite in the right mode, but that's okay because we need to learn how to load a show. Um, that's an important part of using Onyx in what we're going to do here. So we can press close patch here in the bottom or back up here in the top. You got either option, whether you like to reach the top of your screen or the bottom. And now we're going to go ahead and load our show. So we go to the Onyx menu, press load, and you find that show. So for me, it's in the downloads folder. Of course, it could be on the USB if you're on a console. We find the webinar file. 
And we're going to go ahead and, and open that up. In just a second, I promise we're going to go over connecting with Capture. I promise, I promise, I promise. <laughs> there are so many questions about that, but, but we're getting there. Yeah, iDialog, don't worry about the Z350 mode and amount because we're going to load that demo file that was sent out to you via email. Okay, so go ahead and load that file as I just showed you. Uh, we also can go ahead, just so you're aware, uh, you noted that when we first started the software, there was the ability to load from the start screen. And then that's another way to load files if you're just starting up the console or the software. Um, but since we're already in it, we can go through the menu, use the load there. So give me a little done in the chat when you're loaded and I will continue. And we have such beautiful color coding on this uh, demo file. Cool, awesome. I did the thing. <laughs> Thank you, Evan, who I believe was my neighbor here. Um, so the first thing you might see is, you probably will see if you're in the same version of me as me, is um, the show has been optimized from an older version, uh, updated from an older version and was optimized for the software. Please save the show file for faster startup in the future. So again, you should probably just save it. You know, one of the things we're gonna mention here a lot on this webinar is save, save often, save all the time. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sorry to laugh, but Bob Mentel. Oh my goodness. He just wrote me a message in there and he's cracking me up. No, it's all good. It's all good. There are many solutions, Bob, to numbering fixtures. Um, when you do hit save by default, if you're on the PC, it defaults to the same directory or on the consoles actually. Um, it saves to the, uh, the same place that um, you go ahead and... Uh, that you open the file from. Okay, so so that's gonna be in your downloads folder probably right now. But what we wanna do is we wanna go back to our uh, documents and then it's, you might have a bunch of folders, Obsidian. So documents, Obsidian, Onyx, and then there's show files in here. And I do recommend saving it in there. Again, if you're on a console, you'll have the, the internal directories of the console, et cetera. Now, a good question here, Believer's Church is asking here, um, is that, um, is there an auto save? So, um, and, and there's a couple of good questions about show files here, so we'll answer them. Um, so auto save, um, yes and no. So, so the console saves every time that you do something. Like anytime you're doing something, it's always saving to the active show file. When you hit save, you're actually making a backup, okay? Um, uh, you're, only, you're only creating a backup. And so um, save often, save a backup often, but when you go ahead and, oh my goodness, I cannot watch the chat. There's people in here just, just heckling me. Um, and just such as Giancarlo, hey buddy. Um, but the save is just a backup. Now you want to do that backup often, but do know that it's always saving everything you do as the active show file. And that brings up another good question, actually. People ask about shutting down Onyx, especially if you're on a console. Uh, as long as you're not like actively patching or something, you know, like just stop what you're doing, you know, um, don't be patching and just hit the power switch. Really, just hit the power switch. That's all it takes. Um, wonderful thing. Now, somebody noted, um, I had issues with show files saying they were corrupt, I believe from being in Dropbox or another syncing platform. Do you recommend flash drives? or and multiple local copies, uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna answer this one here, Josh. Um, do not, don't use the syncing service with any type of show file ever. Whether you use an Onyx or another console or an audio console or whatever, don't do it. Um, because as you noted, if anything goes wrong or even if you made a mistake, if you accidentally delete a file that you didn't want to, like instantly, like within a minute, you know, with Dropbox or whatever service you're using, um, it syncs everywhere and it's gone. And if you're not on a business account for Dropbox, that thing's really gone, right? Um, and so there's the accidental and there's just, if something happens well, they're copying it and it gets corrupt, whatever, it's just a bad idea. Now, once you've saved your file, you saved your backup, go ahead, copy that to a USB device copy that to Dropbox. Um, there's an old saying that I think is, is really wise on 
copying and backing up show files. That is um, save it on the console, of course, itself. Save it somewhere that's on your person. Save it somewhere that's somebody else's person. So you have a flash drive, you hand it to somebody else. Save it to the cloud, right? The internet. Um, so that no matter what happens, right? The venue gets struck by lightning. There's a fire in the building, right? These things like they can happen. Um, no matter if something happens to you, you get sick or something more unfortunate happens, you know, or your friend, you know, the show could still go on and someone can still get to that file, you know, so it can never, um, you can never save enough. You really can't. Uh, and the cool thing is when you do hit save as well, you may notice here, it gives you the name of your show file. Then it gives you the date. Then it gives you the software version. Okay. And, and it also in the middle of that, sorry, it has a little timestamp too. And so as long as you don't save more than once a minute, if you save twice, try to save twice in a minute, you'll have to, you know, stick something on the end of the file name to make it unique. But it saves the minute in there that, that you were at. So all of that's in this file name so that when you go to look at a backup, you know exactly when you created it as long as the time on your computer is correct. Um, so save everywhere, you know, save on the PC if it's a real show and not just playing around, you know, save to a flash drive. But again, you know, flash drives are physical media, right? They could get wet, crushed, whatever, um, et cetera. Can you use a show on an older uh, console or build of the software? No, you can't. Um, but you can use files from older versions of the software, of course, in newer versions of the software. That's no problem at all. Um, and so that is one limitation there. Okay. Let's focus, on, let's go back here as to what's going on. If you're having technical issues, uh, personally, Matthias will, will be there in the chat and I greatly appreciate his help, but let's get going here. So we're gonna go ahead and set up our capture file. Now there's a couple different ways in, that you can set up your, your capture in the, the connection between the two, okay? So the first thing with capture I always say is load up your console first, be sending that at DMX or however you're connecting, type info, and then open capture second once you're ready to go. Okay, so if you have this demo open, you can close it. Mine's connected, but if yours isn't, just close it. We'll reopen it in a second, okay? Now we'll press Onyx in the upper corner, go into our menu, and then there's a couple ways to connect capture. Now, the older way, and this completely works, is to go through Ether DMX here. And if you've been in here before, you'll notice in this version of the software, they've changed some things around. They've made it a little easier to use. Um, and, so, and so that is great. What I would do if I was connecting uh, to Capture is you can send SACN universes one through four, um, and you can put that on your ethernet. You can put that on the loopback interface, which for me is ethernet two. Um, and those both work great. Then you can press apply, okay? And once you do that, it's applied, it's going. Make sure it's on at the top, okay? That's gonna send that info over to Capture. Then inside Capture for the SACN version, and we'll show you a slightly better version in a minute, we can go to universes. And what we should see here is this is the same as in the standalone Capture software is you should be able to see an external universe, your SACN universe, okay? It will say uh, BSR E131 and then have the actual address. Now, I'm using today, and I kind of recommend with this new version using CITP, which is our next guy down, okay? You go ahead to, to set this up. You turn, on, turn it on on your ethernet adapter. Um, I'm using ethernet two, which is the Microsoft loopback adapter, okay? And then you can go ahead and um, you do need to go set up an IP address if you have it. So that's in network settings, interfaces, and then Ethernet 2, the Microsoft Loopback adapter. You could set to, to uh, Ether DMX, then hit apply. Then you can turn on CITP actually right here, okay? And then in the CITP settings, there are actually uh, more settings here. You can, you can do the same thing setting the network interface, but we already did that. Um, there's some different things you can turn on and off, but we're not gonna mess with them here. And then what it should do is it should see capture once you open it, okay? 
If it doesn't for capture, let's see, in this demo of capture, this uh, standalone, it's in a little bit different spot. But we can definitely find it in universes. But is there a network settings window like in the full capture? Don't think there is. Um, and so then you should be able to see the external universe and be able to choose, it, it should automatically map them, but you can get universes one through 16. And they just show up as universes zero through 15. Um, absolutely. And so, and so that's how we want to set it up is my preference here and preference for you guys is, um, is to use that Microsoft Loopback adapter if you have it. Um, if you don't, Use the Wi-Fi adapter. Let me walk you through that, okay? So here in Ether DMX, or rather settings, you can use your Wi-Fi or your Ethernet if that's what you're connected with. And you can send CITP or SACN, either one. I, I'm choosing CITP on that interface. I'm not going to do that, of course, because um, I'm doing a webinar through this network interface. And so, and so what we're gonna do then is turn on that CITP on the loopback adapter, or if you don't have that on your Wi-Fi adapter, press apply, at which point you should be able to open capture, hop over here, not the rendering settings, the universes and see stuff show up, okay? Um, I'll walk through that again. Let me know if you guys have any other questions, if you're seeing it or not. I'm just gonna go for the sake of explanation, turn CITP off, close my capture demo. Go ahead and reopen my capture demo just to show you. So if I open this and I go to universes, Um, so the loopback adapter, if you haven't installed it, it's the Microsoft KM test loopback adapter. Just do a web search on how to install that. Um, Matthias had put some instructions on the chat above, but if you weren't in the webinar at the time when he pasted those, you won't be able to see that. Um, but it's, it's a very generic thing to install. Um, and there's a lot of websites that walk you right through it. Um, so here, with having, without having the CITP turned on, I have nothing in my external universes. Oh, here it is. I can go to more in connectivity options. And here's my network options window that I use in regular capture. Um, and this allows you to go down to CITP. You can choose automatic for automatic network adapter or choose the one you're using, the loopback adapter. Um, and you'll be good to go. But that's only if you're having issues. Close that guy. Close all of capture. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then I can turn it on again on my Ethernet too. Ether DMX, SACN, press apply. Now it's sending. Now I can open capture. Boom. Check my universes. And then we should see it. And of course, that's when it backfires. So to troubleshoot, we go and check the CITP here. And it has capture, but it says it's offline. So I'm just gonna go here to network interfaces, make sure it's enabled. Then I see the pop-up come and I'm ready to rock and roll. All right, then I see in capture, universes, I see the external universes pop up. So let us know in the chat uh, if you've done that, if you're seeing uh, capture, if you're connected, or if you're having an issue. And uh, we'll do our best to troubleshoot through those. Awesome, cool Richard's there, great. Awesome, Joel thinks he's there. We're gonna verify in a minute that everything's working. <laughs> Run through the test as we always do. Cool, cool, Antunes there, cool, awesome. 
Very good. Great. Get some people there. This is good. Great. Cool. Okay, so if you're having issues, hop in the uh, question answer and let us know um, what's going on and we can help you as best we can. If you haven't installed the loopback adapter, you'll want to do that. That's for sure. And if there's a lot of people having trouble with that, I can walk through that process, but I've already got it installed, so I can't walk through all of it. Um, I could do it mostly. And yeah, uh, Cynthia noticed that the big thing about CITP is that if I select the light in capture and move it around, or if I uh, select the light in Onyx and move it, it does it in both places. All right. Um, Antune is asking uh, CITP in network protocols is off, but in network interfaces. So Antune here on CITP, it needs to be on right here for your network interfaces, choosing the, uh, the appropriate loopback adapter. Then in the Ether DMX, or rather the, uh, sorry, in the settings, network settings, clicking on that interface, you'll want to make sure CITP is also on there, that we're set to Ether DMX and that you press apply. All right, that should be on in both places. Now, if it's not on in both places, do turn it on and that will definitely solve things. Great, cool, awesome. All right, now while we're all checking this here, um, excuse me, making sure we're good, we'll just check, make sure everything works real quick. So what I like to do, and I know all of you might not be connected here, but that's okay, we'll, we're gonna get there is we'll hit back here. And truth be told, you'll be able to follow 90% of what I do without the visualizer, but I would love to get it connected for you. Um, is um, we're gonna go ahead and hit highlight here at the top. So we're in fixtures presets, the first view. I'm just gonna hit highlight here in the top so it's blinking. And then this allows me to click on lights. And when I do, I see them in capture, they turn on, they turn white, we can see them, and this means we're good. Try at least with highlight, at least a fixture or two of each type. That way, when you see them come on, you're gonna know, hey, we're good, you know? And, uh, and then we're there. Let's see, I'm watching the chat here, seeing how people are doing. Let's see, Matias is working through a few. Um, so if you don't have it working yet, we'll spend just another quick minute on this before we move forward is, um, is, do you have the questions here? Okay. Or do you have the first things to check or do you have the loopback interface, um, installed? Do you have CITP turned on in two places? All right. It looks like most people are getting there though. And Matias is going to get to the rest and that's great. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do here is uh yeah this integration with capture is nuts and we're going to go more into that on thursday it's, it's so cool when i first saw it and it, how it worked and bob mentel ran me through like auto creating the 2d plan what we're going to go into that on thursday you don't want to miss that it's so cool um how it works so you, you don't want to miss it. um but so highlight through some lights make sure they work and then we're going to pull up our command keypad here um if you're on a console like a real physical console, you have one of these in front of you, so don't worry about it. But if you're not, pull up the command keypad, press clear, press highlight, uh, so that we're all starting from the same place. Where's the hey, Cynthia says? It is actually a fixture that we can control, Cynthia. Uh, I'll get there. Um, and so what we're doing here, guys, is uh, we're going to go ahead, sorry, I just bumped my microphone, and start with our 2D plan. So we're already patched. We've patched all the fixtures here um, because if we do go to the patch, I'll just show you quick, you don't have to follow this. If we do go to the patch, we'll see here after the first three type of fixtures, we get into what I like to call an installed venue patch. Um, and Bob, this is not you know your fault. It's just, uh, this is how a lot of installers patch things sometimes. 
is, you know, to get the most out of each port, they patch things in really funky order sometimes to, to get the most out of each DMX universe. And it's fine if you're in a permanent install. Uh, and, um, but um, other than that, you know, you're good to go. Um, and so we can see everything in here. It's good to go. We'll hit back here. And so now we're gonna go ahead and I like to, I like to, oh, Bob, you're funny. Okay, so I like to go ahead and create my 2D plan first. Now, there already is a 2D plan because Bob created one, um, but I'm just gonna show you the basics of creating a 2D plan so you know how to do it. You don't have to follow along too much. And in um, a future webinar, such as on Thursday, I believe, just gotta double check or maybe next Tuesday, Oh, I'm going to check my notes super quick. Yeah, on Thursday, we're going to really go into the 2D plan, go a lot deeper, cover a lot more. Um, but for now, if you don't have a 2D plan created, I mean, you do if you open this file. Um, we just hit the live key right up here. We're in edit mode. And then we go ahead and select fixtures. So we can do that in the fixture preset window. There's other ways to do it, and we're going to talk about all that. Um, and we can just select some fixtures. So say I select these 10, this is one of many ways to select my fixtures. Then I'm here in my 2D plan. I'm in edit mode. I'm gonna hide the options so that I can see more. Then I can press add. I have different add modes, the line one I'll use because it's quick. Place your fixtures. Then it tells you at the top to draw a line to place said fixtures. You go ahead and do that. And uh, then you're able to pop out of that and have control of them in 2D plan view. Like I said, tomorrow we're going to go through like a full, like everything in 2D plan, how it all works, different things you can do. But for now, uh, this is the basics. And I'm just going to drag a box around these fixtures and hit delete to make them go away so that we just have Bob's beautiful, lovely 2D plan work. The 2D plan probably is wearing a tie right now. Um, and we're good to go. Awesome. So let me scroll back in my notes to where in the world I was. So I make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah, we're going to go over how to save a queue. Uh, have no worries, folks. We're going through each part. We're just not covering the 2D plan creation as deeply today. So we have time to go deeply over other things. Okay, cool. So, da -da -da -da. so now, ba -ba 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 -ba. let me make sure I'm in the right place. Let's go ahead and build our first presets, okay? So I'm gonna hop over to some quick slides here and we're gonna talk about kind of the philosophy, the overarching, like, here's why we program the way we do and here's why lighting consoles for the most part work the way they do, um, et cetera. And so um, we'll go ahead, we've taken questions as we've gone through this and we've covered them. So we'll uh, make a general questions time a little bit later, um, but, um, what is the programmer? The first step of working in Onyx is what is the programmer and why in the world do we care? Good question. So the programmer is, um, you know, in, at least in view, it's a window that we open up and we can see the lights that we've selected in the attributes that we've modified um, since we last hit the clear key, okay? And that part's gonna be important. So if we're starting from scratch, we just boot it up. Um, there's gonna be nothing in here. But as we select lights and we give them attributes, whether directly or through presets, the preferred way as we make them, um, it's going to show us what we're actively working with. And the key here and the reason why we care is because, uh, uh, well, just as a little history lesson, when I started with lighting, I know I'm just an ancient old man, I'm not. Um, but when I first started with lighting, I started with older style non-moving light consoles that when you hit record and you programmed a cue, you programmed a fader or a button or a cue in a cue list or whatever. Um, when you do that, you would capture the entire output of whatever was coming out of that console. Whatever you saw on the stage, whatever was coming out of the DMX jacks, all of that stuff, whatever was at zero, whatever was at full, whatever was being brought up manually, whatever was being brought up by a fader, all of those things were brought together and recorded. 
And the big downside to how that worked and the way that that we recorded the whole output like that and simpler, you know, lighting packages that aren't professional today still do that and it has its place. But the reason why we don't like that is because it's really inflexible. Like, what if there's a band doing a sound check going on? You can't constantly be clearing and turning all the lights off and starting with just a light or two again while someone's working on a stage. They need light to see. Um, if you're doing a corporate event or something at the church, you know, you may need to program things during a rehearsal while people are on stage. They need lights on. And so we want to be able to program only portions. We only want to record portions of what we see on the output or maybe with blind, nothing on the output. Um, and we want to be able to record just parts of things and not all of all the things. And the reason why we want to be able to record partial things and not all the things is that it then allows us a lot more flexibility when we're playing back things, right? That old method of, of capturing the entire output worked well when you only wanted to play back one or two faders at a time, or you wanted to bring things together and it would always just be additive and it would just add to each other. But when it comes to a piece of software like Onyx and a console like the Onyx consoles, you have the ability to maybe you make a fader that just has a couple lights on it or one light. And maybe you have another fader or playback button that has all of your lights on it doing something else. You want to have the ability to just interrupt the playback of either one of those. Maybe you have a look with a bunch of lights on and you just want to grab a fader and you just want to be able to override basically just a couple lights and have them do something new while all the rest of the lights are doing something old. And when you have this ability, it allows you, and this I, I get that this can be one of those things that, you know, right now kind of seems up in the clouds and, and weird, but it gives you the ability to combine things together in much better ways and to be able to go ahead and... Um, Interesting. Uh, just reading this uh, this in the questions, we'll cover this in a second. But it allows you to mix things together in, in lots of different ways and be able to get ultimate flexibility out of your playback. And ultimately, um, if you go ahead and, you know, you're going to use another console, I mean, you shouldn't because Onyx is amazing and I love it. But say somebody else owns a console and you use it. Um, most modern moving light type consoles work with the programmer. They work this way. Uh, Matthias was just noting, um, and uh, Firma Jaro was noting, that one of the first people involved with Onyx, uh, well, what's known as Onyx, was the first user of Hog 1 and the master trainer for Hog 2. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what everybody else's history is in here. I know a lot of people aren't newer to things and whatnot, but I definitely learned Hog first, as at the time, um, it was the most popular console here. Um, and, uh, you know, there's similarities, such as the programmer. So why we care about the programmer is that when we're about ready to hit record and put something onto a playback, whether that be a fader, a button, something on screen, et cetera, it's really darn good to be able to see what you're actually recording, right? Because you may have faders up, you may have things playing back, and those are all affecting your output to your stage, your DMX output, as well as what's in the program. The faders and what's in the program where both go out the output, both happen on the lights, okay? Um, but only what's in the programmer gets recorded when you hit record. And so, especially if you're in a hectic show, or even if you're not, just if you get sidetracked easily like me, um, you can go ahead and, and you can, you can see exactly what's in the programmer so that, you know, as you hit that record key, exactly what's in there and what's not in there to be recorded. Okay. And so that is ultimately, uh, what the programmer is and why we care. Um, maybe you've noticed, like somebody noticed when I started talking about the programmer here, I've always wondered why it was there. And that's a great question. Um, and if you've ever started, maybe you start programming, you select some lights and you, you move them, pan and tilt them, you turn them on, and then you go grab some coffee or somebody says, hey, bud, you know, such and such is the, you know, did you take the, the trash in the bathroom? I don't know. Um, gosh, I've been home too long. We need some gigs. Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody says something to you and then you go back to the console and you forget where you were and you go, okay, 
I know I was working on some stuff. What was I working on? And what was I about to record? And did it have everything in there that I wanted to work with? Well, the programmer is going to give you that information. Um, what I like to do most often is if I don't have a lot of screens, like maybe I'm just on one screen or whatever, if I can just get the programmer off on a non-touch screen or something like that, I just leave it up all the time. Then it's always there. Um, then you can always see what's going on, okay? Um, and uh, that's really helpful as well. So from the programmer, that's where we select things. We see what goes on. There's a few other concepts we want to talk about, and then we're going to cover them in the software, okay? The first is groups. So I've talked a lot, and I've mentioned a lot here, selecting fixtures, okay? Selecting lights. We call them fixtures in Onyx because um, it might not be something that actually outputs light, right? There are things that we can control with DMX, such as fog machines, fans, whatever, that are technically not lights. So we call them fixtures. That's all that means. Um, and when we have fixtures, sure, we can type in their numbers or press their little buttons on the screen, and we can select what we want. And that works great when you have like 10 fixtures, but when you have like a thousand, that's a really bad idea, right? Because that's slow as molasses, and you don't want to do that, okay? So ultimately, um, what you want to do is have a way to select groups of lights. We call those groups. It's really original. Um, and so all that a group is, is just a, a predefined group of lights. Now, the cool thing about this is they don't all have to be the same type of light, okay? So I've got some examples here. So they could be all the lights on your front truss, which could be a mix of moving lights and regular lights and LEDs and whatever. They could be all of one particular type of light. They could be all of your lights, you know, 100% of your lights, everything, okay? Um, and, um, and for those, if you're wondering, if you're not getting Capture Connected, it's not totally integral. You can still learn what's going on here without it. It's just a good help. And especially after the fact, if you go ahead and get that set up, uh, you'll be able to play around later. So don't feel like you have to leave or miss everything if you don't have capture set up. Um, so that's groups. Next, we've got presets. Now, presets are a little more ethereal, a little bit harder to understand, but almost probably more important than groups, I would say. Definitely as important, okay? And what presets are, are another building block for Q creation, our next layer when we're gonna build something. And they're grouped into what we call parameter groups which in Onyx are intensity, position, color, beam, beam effects, and framing. And if you go to other lighting consoles, you're going to find they're pretty much the same, um, you know, the same groupings, right? The same parameter groups on other lighting consoles are, you know, they vary, they didn't vary a little bit, but at the end of the day, light is light. And these are the attributes that lights, modern stage lights have, right? Um, these are the things they can do. So when it comes to presets, what we're going to do is we're gonna take groups, we're gonna take selections of lights within groups or individually, and we're going to apply presets to them as we're programming, okay? And so there's a couple reasons why this is really key. Um, presets we can use in a live environment during a show, but most often we don't. What presets do is they save our butt, okay? <laughs> and they make our life easier. So a preset is really just where you record um, sp specific lights. I recommend putting every light that can do the given function. If that's intensity, that's probably every light. If it's color, that's, that might be every light. If it's moving, that's just going to be your moving lights. So you take all the lights that can do the thing, whatever the thing is that you're making the preset for, and you uh, go ahead and make those lights do the thing, right? So you might bring them to full for intensity. For position, you might point them at a given spot on stage. Then for color, you might go ahead and make them blue or red. For beam, you'll do uh, zoom and gobos and stuff like that, okay? Um, and so presets are really this middle ground where we save preset setups so that when we go to the third step queues, we're able to select the lights, select the preset, record it to a queue. Now, it's not just something that's there to speed up our programming, okay? If we thought it was just there to speed up our programming, we wouldn't need it. I mean, sure, it's helpful, 
in the sense that with positions or colors, you know that if you select the same position or the same color, and then you record that in different cues around different places within your show, you know it's going to look the same every time because you built it off the same preset. But then there's an extra, an extra layer to that, which is that it's going to look the same every time in every queue you use it in. And if you need to update it later, this is, this is very important. You can just update that preset and every queue that was built with that preset gets updated with the new preset information, okay? So you built some queues with this blue and then your boss, client, whomever, yourself, walks in the next day and says, ooh, that's just not right. You need to tweak that blue. Well, if you only recorded that blue in one queue, it would take you like two seconds to fix that. If you put that in like 500 queues, you would be like, um, okay, let's get a, coffee pot, uh, a, a pot of coffee over here. A coffee, <laughs> never mind, Look, a pot of coffee over here, right? That would be bad. Um, we don't want to do that. And so presets allow us to update anything that we've created off the preset in queues later. Um, and when we update a preset, it updates every queue that was created for that preset, from that preset. And that's a really big deal. Now, can you go in later to a queue and change the preset that you know a particular part was was uh, made with? Sure, you can do that. You're not like locked in forever if you need to change you know some lights from red to blue or whatever in a queue. You could totally do that. But the function of the preset and the reason why it's so important is it allows you to update things later and it makes things consistent. So you can go straight from groups to queues, like we're going to talk about in a second. You know, just select. Uh, assign different attributes. That's what we call lazy programming. And that's not meant to offend anybody because, you know, occasionally I do it um, and, and I shouldn't. But, um, but ultimately going through that layer of preset, it takes a little bit of extra time on the front end. You could argue it does, but often if you're programming a lot of cues, it actually saves you time. But then when it goes to updating things, when you're in the long haul and you use a show over multiple days or weeks or months, or you take it to a different venue, uh, presets are really going to save your butt and you don't want to be without them. So cues, then we get to cues. Cues are so fun. Why are cues fun? Because we've spent all this time, you've been on this stinking webinar with me for an hour and 40 minutes and we still haven't made any lights turn on. We still haven't hit play on a button and made things work. What are we, when are we ever going to get to that stuff? Well, you know, the preparation really matters. And so the cue is the last step. When we hit record, we place it on a fader, we place it on a button, or an on-screen control, and in one step, we get what we want, right? We get the lights that we chose doing the things that we chose them to do all at once, okay? Um, and so that's what we're gonna do there. Boom, so groups, select them, place them into presets, place those into queues, okay? The last thing to know with queues is tracking. Okay, and actually, you know, I think we're gonna demo through this and then we'll get to tracking in just a few minutes. So don't let me forget that. Okay, because I think it's worth, it makes sense to demo through what we've done already. So let me go grab my capture file. Boom, we're gonna run through the basics here. So we're in our fixtures and presets window and we see here across the top, we have fixtures. We have the ability here on this bottom pane to switch between fixtures, groups, mask, auto, and selected. Um, and what we're gonna do here is create some groups. So now notice I'm clicking on these, but you can also tap. You see how that flashed yellow maybe you did when I started? I'll do it again. So when you first tab, it's gonna show you what window you're in and you can hit tab to switch between those windows. That's something that's uh, newer to the software, not super new, but what hasn't been around forever. So we're going to go ahead and build our first presets. Now, across the bottom here is where the presets are, okay? And we see here they're divided into intensity, pan tilt, color, gobo, beam, beam effects, and framing. Just like we talked about, those are the attributes uh, that they have. Is there a keyboard shortcut to go backwards? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think anything makes you go backwards through the panels, just forward. But hey, we didn't used to have a preset uh, keyboard shortcut at all. This is great. <laughs> no, I know you're just asking uh, to, to know, and that's great. Um, but there isn't one, um, unless Matthias chimes in and says, no, David, you're wrong, which happens from time to time. Um, 
And so here, those are our different types of presets. Now, presets are interesting in that in the default, we keep them completely separate. Intensity goes in intensity, pan tilt goes in pan tilt, color goes in color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can override that. If you have a special need, a use case, something fancy you're trying to do, you can put all of the parameters into any type of preset. They are, they can go across in that sense, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and make our first preset. All right, guys. And so, yeah, that is what I'm saying, uh, Ivan, is that I can separate presets on one screen and, and color presets on another. We're going to talk about that in a second. So first things first, we just want to select all of our lights. Now, there's two ways to do this, okay? The first, as we noted, is just pressing on the lights. But that's slow, right? That's really slow. So I've popped up my command keypad here. Or if you have a keypad on your computer or console, you can just type the fixture numbers. And so we see we start at fixture one here. And if we scroll down on the side here, we can scroll down and see how many fixtures we have. We have, uh, well, 201 starts the camera and capture and 202 is the, the hazer, the smoke box. So we'll just go to 109. So to select all those lights, we just go one through 109. Enter and let me know in the chat when you're there. Awesome. Now that we're there, um, you may have noticed here, when I went through this window, I can press the arrows. The little arrows do a line at a time. The big arrows do the full window at a time. And this little belly button in the middle, and so just call it a belly button, is actually a touch and grab uh, scroller that has variable speed. So that's also very cool as well. And uh, we can also go ahead and just uh, go to the middle of our window with this funky eye. So now that we've got all those lights selected, all we've got to do to bring them to full, there's two ways to do it, but the simplest way to do it is press at full on our keypad. And then we should see it in capture. Of course, you guys already tested that. Awesome. Very cool. And we'll see those at full. Thing is done. <laughs> so true, but it's better than just seeing done. And so now that we've got them at full, let's press record. And then here, this window might pop up and be in your way. Don't worry about it. You can move it wherever you want. You can kick it out. Um, and we're going to go here. We're in the intensity window for presets here. Notice I can change windows and stuff if I need to. Um, there are other consoles where hitting record records window views. Uh, that's not how it works here. And so I can switch windows without accidentally recording over window views. And I'm just going to select my first preset. So I'm making sure I'm scrolling all the way up again. Click the first one. Boom. Then before I click anywhere else, before I do anything, very important, I'm going to type a name. I mean, it's not that important. I'm going to type at full. It's going to say down in the command line here, rename preset intensity one, at full, press enter. It's named. Now we can go ahead and press clear. We're going to press it twice. Okay, with the clear key, this is that Bob at the center. Um, I don't know, the guy's not wearing a bow tie. Might not be Bob. Um, and so... <laughs> Um, one of the cool things about presets, as we noted, is so, okay, we just took all of our lights and we programmed them into a preset, right? Now, I can select that preset, ensure it applies and I see the lights. But I don't have to select it on all the lights at once. And this is something I commonly see. So if I just choose my lights one through 10 here and press enter, I can now press that preset and only lights one through 10, just go ahead and, oh, the chat bomb. Um, just lights one through 10 come up to full. Just one lights one through 10 come to that preset. Since I've got lights one through 10 selected, um, and I could choose any combination, as long as it's in that preset initially, um, we can select any lights, one light, 10 light, 50 lights. And as long as they're in that preset, when we select the lights, hit the preset, they're good. Now I talked about groups and we skipped over making a group, who knew? So let's go over here to groups real quick. So I've got my lights selected, I had, I'd selected one through 10. And if I don't wanna type one through 10, enter for the rest of my life, then what I'm gonna do here is press record, press on a group. So it's the same process we use with the preset. And now I got a group. Now, oh, that's where I was going. 
So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to press clear twice. Okay, clear once is going to deselect. Clear twice clears out the programmer. Um, and now I didn't name my group one. So I could have hit record, press the button, type, hit enter, and that names my group, just like with the preset. Now, I didn't go ahead and I didn't, I didn't do that. Okay, here, I didn't name it, but I want to go back and do that. So what we're going to do here then is go ahead and press our group and then just type. Except this was not all. This was only the spots, which are the uh, whatever, the fuse whatevers. And I just hit enter. So I can always click on it later, type a name, hit enter, rename it, whatever I want. Uh, one particular, two particular questions that are coming through. Remember to use, excuse me, the Q&A section for questions. That's really important. Um, Jerry did. Um, and uh, so, because sometimes in the chat, things get really lost. So is there an all preset? So Jerry, you might've come from another lighting console that had an all preset type. And they, they aren't in there by default in Onyx, but any of the presets here can actually be an all preset type. Um, this is probably over the heads of some people here. So you can go ahead and you can record. Uh, and when you go to record a preset, you can use these filters here. And if you want all types, you can highlight them all, record that into a preset. And you'll see in the corner here, there's a little eye. And if you record a preset with multiple parameter groups in it, it would say, you know, I, P to, or I and P for pan tilt and C for color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So any of the preset groups, can be, can have all presets, okay? Um, and so that's important as well. Now, for some of you, if you're just starting out with this, don't worry about an all preset. Um, that's definitely a more advanced thing. When you wanna do particular things, sometimes that makes sense to do, okay? Um, now, uh, some nice people who are definitely from uh, somewhere that's not the US said, what intensity levels do you prefer to record on a preset list, okay? Uh, like every 10% or something. You know, honestly, it depends on the show or the service that I'm doing um, and how many gradations of intensity I want to use. And the same goes for especially things like color. You could program a lot of colors. You could program a lot of intensity presets. Ultimately, you probably want to program presets for the amount, for the most, um, you know, things that you, the things you think you'll use a lot, on, you know, like, there's no clear cut, like, this is the answer for everyone. Um, like, if I'm lighting a band, you know, I'm going to do 100%, 50%, 10%, zero. You know, sometimes not even that much. Um, if it's theater or, like, a corporate gig where I need lots of intensity levels or whatever, I might do, you know, every 20% or something. Um, the thing about presets is we can edit them, we can update them later. So there's a couple things we want to go over, and then I'll, I'll go over editing them. Because sure, like our lights here are all at full in this preset. But what I often like to do, especially when lighting for the camera, which you're pretty much always doing these days, even if you're not lighting for, you know, film cameras, even if you're not lighting for iMag, there's people pulling their phones out of their pocket, taking pictures, and you need it to look good. Okay. Um, and so people are always pulling out the camera. So for a preset for like 100%, I might go in later when I'm on site and, and, you know, level everything out so that if I have a light that's really bright and one that's not as bright, I'll even those out so that my at full for the really bright light kind of caps it at some place where it's, you know, about as bright as the less bright light um, so that they look good on camera together. Okay. A um, couple quick questions that did come through though, before I demo that is how do I label a group or a preset again? Stuart asked this. It's really simple. You just click on it. So click on the group or preset. Boom, there's a group. Then I'll go to the preset. Just click on it, type. And you'll see in the bottom, like I have the group selected and the preset here. But it says here at the bottom, rename preset intensity one. So that lets me know, okay, the last thing I touched was intensity one. That's what's being renamed. I just named it spot, which is not at all what I want it named. So I'm just going to click on it again. And I'm going to do it again. You can do that as much as you want. You can rename to your heart's content. <laughs> and that's no problem. As I see here, people are noting here uh, how they like to, to do intensity presets, how many they like to do. And it's all over the board. Like it really does come down to what you're lighting and how much control you want. Now you may go and put this, the intensity on a fader, but if you build it off of that preset, 
you could later change the maximum brightness of, of that fader through the preset. Um, and there are definitely advantages to doing that. Okay. Um, can we assign a color to a group of presets? Uh, yes, we'll go over that on Thursday in the, in the webinar. Um, and so somebody, Tim is asking, can I select value only like a star gobo? And can you merge presets? Like if the fixture is close to the same pattern and you wanna merge the pattern on the preset button. I'm trying to figure out exactly uh, what you're, you're guessing. And Ted, Ted brought it up an extra, ex, a great point here in the chat actually, um, where, you know, sometimes people make no presets and that's a problem. You need to make some presets. Um, but a lot of people do find themselves in the rut of making too many presets and that can be crazy too. I like to make kind of the bare bones presets that I think I'll need, you know, some basic colors, some basic positions, some basic intensity levels. And then when I'm going along through my show, if I'm in a place where I'm programming away, you know, drinking my coffee or whatever, and I'm like, okay, you know, I want to go ahead and I have this other position or whatever, and I want to add that to a preset. Like once I go ahead and, and, in building queues, I can still create presets anytime I want and add more in. So you can always make more, um, but you shouldn't start with zero. So anyways, <laughs> keep it easy. Otherwise you will confuse yourself. This is my motto, says JP. Yeah, that's great. Um, so creating the preset. Okay, all we're gonna do real quick is select either individual fixtures or our group that we've made, okay? Then, we select the preset, or then, sorry, no, we're not making a queue. We're making a preset, David, stay focused. Then we're gonna go ahead and press at and press full to get the lights at full, okay? Um, you can select some of your lights, you can select all your lights. I recommend selecting all your lights. But while we're here, Justin T, creating the preset again, uh, for those who apparently didn't pay attention, <laughs> that's what you said, not I. Um, then, <laughs> Then um, another way to select things is to use the encoders. So this arrow pops up our encoders here. These are the encoder belts. If you have a console with belts or the wheels, if you have a console with wheels. And I can go right here to in the intensity parameter group and I can jog this up and down to get whatever percentage I want. I can use full center and zero here at the top to jump to those values. And then when I find what I want, and this is how we'll do with the other attributes, I just press record. I press the button that I want to use. I'm just gonna press the existing button and I'm gonna cancel it, but you would press record, press the button and it wouldn't ask you any other questions. Okay, and then you can press clear twice and you're good to go. Awesome, very cool, yeah. Very cool. Um, so yeah, we'll go over the rest of the stuff. Um, any questions over what we've gone over so far that we can answer quick? Evangelist, oh, sorry, man. Can we see the Q&A after the webinar? Um, so we can't, like, if if this is the Evangelist who works for um, Capture, I mean, I think Matias can download it for you and maybe send it to you, um, but it's not gonna be part of the replay because that's just gonna be a, vi a video file. Um, and so that's how that works. Not a bad idea to bring out the virtual keyboard in a, into a small hardware USB. Uh, I mean, Matias can comment on that. I doubt there'd be enough sales to justify it. And you can buy, I mean, if you go on Amazon or wherever you go, because your your name is Fen, so you're probably not in the US, but you could be, I know a guy named Fen. Um, you can just get like a side keypad, you know, for a PC or a laptop, They like a, just a generic number pad. And they, they're like really cheap. And there's no way they'd be able, Obsidian would be able to make it for the price that people sell them on Amazon or make them for, you know, our industry is pretty small. Um, yeah, cool. Awesome. Not seeing any questions. Oh, there's one. Cool. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's go ahead, guys, and create a couple more groups. This is, this is a good workshop type thing and a couple more presets, okay? And so you can work pretty quick, especially with the keypad, especially if you're not just on a touch screen, but even if you are, you can. And so we made a, a group for our spots, but let's just go ahead, make a group for each other type of fixture. Okay, um, and so there's a couple ways to do this. The first 
is there's these auto groups that are already made for you. Um, now there's a few extra things in here. These are things that Bob brought in there and then either repatched or deleted. Um, and so that's okay. Um, but we'll see each type of fixture in here. You can select them. So we had the profiles, then we had our darts. You can select those, then press record, press a new group button. Are there, there dots or there darts? I think they're darts. I always forget. Um, they're darts. It says it right there. Pay attention, David. Um, then we press clear. We always want to press clear. Once clears your selection, twice clears everything uh, between making groups of different types of lights or between making different presets or between making different cues. You often want to clear. With cues, there's a little caveat there, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so then we go, we have the darts. Then we have the seven battens. Now there's a few options here because there's some smaller ones and some bigger ones where we can select the whole fixtures or the smaller bits. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Just choose the one right now that doesn't have an E something in the corner. Get our seven batten four twos and our seven twos. I'm just gonna put them together in a group for today. Record, give them a name. And then clear twice. I mean, clearing once does clear the selection. I'm just a crazy person. I always press clear twice if I know I want to clear everything. Fuse pendants. Those are the house lights. So go. I'm going to record this. I'm going to put it in the other corner of my groups tab so that it's kind of separate. I always like to put my, my house lights in a separate spot um, because then I don't accidentally do stuff with them when I don't mean to. And when I do mean to get them, I do get them. Then we got the fuse wash Z3. 50s. Record those as a group and call it wash mover. Awesome. And that will be good for us for the minute here. Oh, and then we can go select all four of these groups and you can go ahead and do this and let me know when you're done. I know it'll take a minute. Select all four of these stage groups. Record. I'm gonna make a new group and I'm gonna call this all stage. And then I select my house lights as well and my all stage group, record. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, make this all, all, oops. A couple questions that came in as you guys do this is, uh, Dave asks, are automatic groups proper groups? And if so, why duplicate them? Is it an organization thing? Yes, um, it is completely an organization thing because when I have the automatic groups in the same window as the all the groups, then I don't have to switch windows to get all the a single fixture and I can work faster. Um, you can with the auto groups. Can you, can you copy them? I forget, let's find out. Copy, press the group. No, that doesn't work. I don't think you can move them either. I think you do just have to select them and then make a new one. But I honestly never try to do that. Yeah, you just have to select them, record as a new, and you're good. Can groups, JP, are you, JP, you know the answer. Oh my goodness. There's people asking questions. And Bob, if JP asks simple questions, just smack him on the side of the head. He's a, he's a good friend. Um, so can you move groups around? You know, as you can probably see, uh, We've got some groups here and I've kind of scattered them about just because I like to keep things separate if they're different types of things. That's a personal thing. Um, but can you move them around? Of course you can. So we have copy, move, and delete here and they do exactly what they sound like. So let's hit move for a second. Then we're going to hit one of our groups. And by the way, this is exactly the same as our, um, as our uh, presets. They work the same way. So move, press the group, press where you want it to go. Simple as that, it moves. Copy, same deal, copy, press the group, press where you want it to copy to, okay? Now delete, press the group or preset, press enter, confirm it because when you delete it, it goes away for real. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's not clear unless you cl clear seven to nine or maybe 10 times as some various people are saying, that's the truth, amen to that. Now in Onyx, you only need to clear twice. <laughs> but I know, yeah, absolutely. A couple questions have come up about 
putting fixtures in groups um, on the same screen. And um, you can, you absolutely can. And in the if you can join us for the webinar um, in two days on Thursday, that would be great. Um, I am showing my groups right now. Um, but for those of us in the chat, but uh, but we can uh, we can modify the views to do whatever we want. Um, so we can have fixtures and groups together. Um, if you need them literally within the same window pane, like the same you know grid of numbers, like I could put them side by side, or I could put one a row of uh, fixtures and then a row of groups. But a group can can contain only one fixture. So if you want to go select the fixture, record groups you know, spot one, oops, see, I could just type again if I mess that up. Um, you can totally go ahead and you can totally make a group for individual fixtures. A group can have one fixture, a group can have many fixtures. Matthias is typing an answer to you, even better. Um, Venkatesh said, hey buddy, why isn't it possible to move fixtures after patching and make tabs of only one fixtures like we do in Grand MA? Um, Venkatesh, I don't know, what you're asking. Um, I believe what you're asking for is possible um, to do. Okay. Um, and so um, you can move fixtures after patching. That's not a problem at all in Onyx. Um, and so, oh, you're saying, Venkatesh, you want to go into the groups tab and you want to make different groups tabs like different tabs along the bottom for each type of fixture might be what you're asking um and that indeed is not possible that's one of those things you know sometimes people ask questions and this is nothing against you Venkatesh but they they're used to doing something one way in a different console and they want it to work exactly the same way in Onyx and it might not work um exactly the same way in Onyx but there's going to be a way to get the same or a very stinking close result. And it might even be easier. Um, and so you were asking, you can move around the fixtures. Absolutely. That's in the, the settings up here. Uh, um, there is a smart grid order. That's one of the options that allows you to separate them by type. But then uh, we should be able to move these around, right? Oops. Maybe you can't move them around. Let's see. You can't move groups, uh, sorry, fixtures, fixtures, because there is no numbers there. As you see, it oh, goes it's just fixture one numbers. 11, then it's maybe 55 through 80. Like it is not a one to one grid. And moving group fixtures is only allowed in the patch, not in this window, because you would actually start repatching and changing fixture IDs when you move groups around. Yes. Yeah, so the so, fixtures so that's... panel is really meant as a representation of your patch with the IDs sorted by that with some automatic wraparound, if you like to. Yeah, so the answer there is you can move them around, but you have to move the fixture number in the patch. And that's not a problem at all. Um, you can totally move the fixture number in the patch anytime um, just by editing Basically, it. Basically, if you want to use this as like a you know selection screen and you want to have it customized, you either need to use the groups window and just make a fixture per you know, make a group that has only one fixture in it, or you use a 2D layout. That's actually really what's meant for this kind of more graphical layout of selecting fixtures. Exactly, cool. So yeah, that's a lot of info about, uh, about groups and such, but that's really good stuff. Um, let's go and talk about real quick, like merging groups and stuff like that, okay? Or merging presets or, or groups. Um, so there's going to be a couple options if you try to update or you need to update a group. And so let's let's walk through that real quick. So like as an example, I've got my spots group here. And it has, if I go to my programmer, my 10 spots in it. Fuse profiles 1 through 10. Okay. Maybe I want to add another light to it. I don't know why, because I do. Okay. So there's a couple ways I could do that. Um, the first is I could select this whole group. Then I go to my fixtures and I find my other light. Maybe I just want to add light 11 in there, 11. Or maybe I'll do, you know what I'll do? I'll do 11 through 18, enter. So now I've selected 11 through 18 as well because the Fuse SFX, it's a, it can do beamy type things, but it's a spot fixture technically. Um, it kind of does both. 
And so, and so now I've got both of those selected and maybe I go to groups and I press record. I press right on top of the group tile I used before. And now I get this little window that says group record conflict. So anytime we're updating or trying to record over top of something that's existing, we're going to get a window that says, hey, what do you want to do? Like, you know, there's multiple ways we could fix this. Uh, so how do you want to do it? And so we have the options of merging, um, which will work. Merging adds anything new. Okay. So like in this instance, I selected the group first, then I selected more lights, and now I'm pressing record. And so really for what I'm doing here, replace will work. Merge is if I had gone ahead and I can do this here, let's just do it. So we're gonna clear. I'm gonna select just that second set. So 11 through 18. And now I'm gonna press record, go to my groups, press spot, okay? Merge, if I press that right now, is going to add in these lights to what's already existing on that group. If I press replace right now, then it's gonna wipe out what was there and put only what's in my programmer, which I can look at. No, I can't because this pop-up's here, but it's 11 through 18, okay? It's, it's those fixtures I just selected. And of course I can see it in capture because we've got this awesome two-way capability, okay? Um, then we have edit command. So if I hit that, it gives me the command line again. I could change what I'm doing. I could change the group number that I'm trying to record, et cetera. Um, or I could just plain cancel the darn thing. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cancel. Oh, hey, and to the person earlier who asked about the tabbing through the windows, I just did remember that I can use the arrow keys once I've hit tab once on those, on those guys, I can use the arrow keys to go backwards. So that is doable, I just forgot it was there. Um, and so, those are some different ways to update a group. What about updating a preset, okay? As we noted here, oh, I'm just gonna clear. When I select all my lights and I put them in this preset, I notice that some of these lights are brighter than others. Like these seven battens are just blowing the snot out of this backdrop right now uh, in comparison to other stuff. So well, what's the guy to do, gonna do to update that? Well, very simply, uh, the easiest way to update just that preset is to go in here with the seven button and we will go deeper into like the actual update function um, on, let's see which webinar we put update in. Just if you're interested, I believe it's gonna be next Tuesday. Yeah, so we'll have update on next Tuesday, which is the one titled, no, not next Tuesday. Thursday this week, which is the one called Intermediate. Okay, so make sure to have that in there. Um, but for now, we'll just take these lights. We're gonna change our intensity. So bring those guys down. That surface is real reflective or those things are real stinking bright. Find them where we like, and we could always change this later if we find out in a color they're not quite bright enough or whatever. And we go ahead and press record press that preset. This time we wanna merge. Again, we've got kind of the same options as we had for the groups. So we've got the ability to replace, but if we haven't selected everything that's in the preset and selected intensity, replace is gonna do bad things uh, because instead of all the lights being in the preset, now it's only the lights we selected. And generally that's not what you wanna do. So merge is gonna be our best bet here. Of course, you can still edit the command or cancel. And as with anything, um, you can press cancel, but you can also press the clear key on the console or on the keypad. In this case, I'm gonna merge. And so now we see our at full preset here. If I clear, let me just clear twice. Select the seven buttons, select at full. They're now at the preset that we're calling at full. It's the brightest we're ever gonna make these lights in our show, but it's not true full, right? For them, it's about 40%, a little bit less, okay? And so that's important to know. You can totally do that stuff, um, totally be able to set things wherever you want, update them at will, and it's gonna update in your queues, okay? Um, let's go ahead and build a few more presets, okay? You guys can do it with me. And I'm gonna show you a couple more ways to select things to be able to, to work uh, with your, your console, be able to work with your lights. So I'm gonna press clear twice. 
And first, I think I'll make a few more intensity presets. So I'm just going to select everything. I know this won't be perfect. I'm going to put them at 50%, enter. And then I'm going to go and explore some different ways that I can work with this. So I already discovered that by default with intensity, I can type at type of percentage. And that's going to put the lights that are selected at that percentage. I can also go to this belt and I can dial that in. I can also pop out this arrow and select one of these output swatches that are at 5%. Now, if you're on a NX wing, NX2 or NX4, then we can totally go ahead. And on the little tiny touch screen, I've got one here. You can go ahead and double tap on the word intensity at the top. And you're going to see this view right here, whatever's on this screen, on the on that keypad. It gets even better with things like color, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm going to pop that, that little guy back in. Go ahead and press record. And then I'm just going to call this half. Then without clearing, because I'm, I'm just selecting all my lights, I want to make more presets. I'm going to go down, say to 10%. Then I'm going to go to zero, record another one. Name them whatever you want, OK? And uh, let me know where we are going. Awesome. Remember, if you're asking questions, especially if you're my friend JP, use the question section so it doesn't get lost in the chat. Let me know where you guys have uh, matched where I am on creating four presets here in intensity. Give us a little done in the chat when you're there. Boom, Solomon's done. I'm done. Cool, cool people are getting done. Awesome, very cool. Cool, awesome. So now let's go ahead and do some uh, pan tilt presets. So now I'm going to go to pan tilt, just pull it up on my screen here. I'm going to press clear twice. And I like to do my pan tilt ones. I usually do it one fixture or one truss at a time. Uh, especially, you know, I always try when I'm setting up my rigs, like I want to have the lights set up on the trusses or on the floor so that they all tilt in the same direction. So they all move in the same way uh, when I move things. And um, ultimately, um, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen, right? You might not have been in charge of setting up. You walk into something that's already existing, whatever. And then, you know, you want to go by fixture type, making your pan tilts. You can do them all at once, but you might not get there. So for pan tilt, uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on highlight. And then I'm just going to make my first preset here. So I'm going to go here to pan tilt and then on these encoders, it's, it's worth noting, I can click and drag with my mouse. Um, I can also use my scroll wheel if you got one on your mouse or, or if you're on a laptop, you got like a two finger scroll kind of set up. I'm just gonna rough something in as a good like stage look. Maybe I'll try to just cover that first portion of the stage here. It's worth noting if these encoders or if you have a console by you, um, like I'm gonna cheat here and the encoders are moving too fast, too slow, you can go ahead and hit this cog in the corner and look for resolution. So that's the resolution of your encoders. That's, okay, how coarse or fine is the control? By default, they're in dynamic mode. A lot of times that works well. It's kind of guessing based off of how quickly you move um, as to if you're trying to be precise or, or to move far and move fast. Um, but ultimately, if that's not working out for you, 16-bit resolution is the finest control, and 8 is the coarsest. Um, and you've got all these steps in between. You can click on any of those. You can assign those to a function key as well. Uh, but we'll not talk about those today um, because those will be in the future webinars. Awesome. Very cool. So if you're having that issue, so we'll just point them at the stage, you know, get it roughed in, right? Maybe I grab my spots, then I grab my darts. Um, I have highlight on. So what highlight does, like I mentioned earlier, 
is it turns the light on, it opens it up and brings it white and um, it allows you to see it real well. And it also, if you deselect the lights, they then turn off. Okay, so then I, I turn on just the darts. So now my spots turned off. They're still in the programmer with pan and tilt values. Okay, um, but now we're gonna go ahead, tilt these guys, find out where they are. Oh, they move fast because that's what they do. Looks like we have some on different trusses. That's okay. Just call that our look. They're in effect light anyways. We're not gonna point them at a stage as a stage wash. Then uh, we have our wash movers. So those are, okay, those are kind of over the presenting area. So we'll point those up towards the band. And then we're gonna, let's use the fanning here. So fanning allows us to just spread lights a little more. Um, and so if I click on pan here, I wanna make sure that it is, um, that it is selected, that it's got this box around it. And then I'll go over here to fanning. So here, when we have this pop-up, whether you're looking at on the surface of a console, on the screen here, whatever, we kind of have two vertical sections, right? We've got the actual parameters that the light does, intensity, pan, tilt, color, beam, beam effects. And then we have this flip side, the right side. We have effects, effects, timing, fanning, grouping, rate, okay? So this column are modifiers for the first column. So we select over here, pan, tilt, and in this case, pan is selected. And then when I go over to fanning, it tells me here at the top, okay, I am first fanning on pan. So it says, okay, the fan tool right now is gonna work with pan. And then we can use the wheels, we can use a scroll wheel, we can click and drag on this cool little doodad here. And we can point these guys around a little bit. And I see they are right over that band, aren't they? That's the, the fun of walking into a rig and not looking at it super close before you do. So then I'm gonna move tilt a little more. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. And then maybe I go back to pan, fanning, and positioning. And then I say, okay, you know what? I wanna work with the lights one at a time. Again, this level of precision might not make sense for today, but I'm just gonna reach over to my encoder wheels, click back over to pan tilt or do so on my console if you have one but I know a lot of people are gonna be on a PC here and that is wonderful. Point those guys. And then I can go ahead and hit the next key again to go to the next light. Move my light around. That guy got all the way over there. Maybe we'll put him up here where, I know there's not anybody right now, but maybe sometimes there is. You pop that guy to the opposite side. Actually, that's what I want to do. Go last, get to my last light, then move my encoders. Again, you don't have to make it pretty for the sake of learning the software. You can make it pretty later because you can always update your presets. So picky. And then those are the back four. I'm just going to ignore those for now. Now I can go ahead and press record, pan tilt preset, boom. Call it at stage. Now I can clear if I want, select my lights, hit the preset, boom, they go there. Awesome, leave Bob black, <laughs> leave Bob in the dark. Well, we've already identified that that is not Bob Mantel because um, Bob Mantel wears a bow tie and he also looks incredibly suave and has long flowing hair. Um, so it's the guy who cuts it short and Matthias who cuts it real short. Uh, <laughs> Um, but there you go. And so now we've made a pan tilt preset. Now, something that's actually really cool that you might find interesting is, say I take these lights, I've got them in this preset, okay? So they're in the pan tilt preset. There's pan tilt info going on in the programmer screen. Now I'm gonna go over here to color. I go over to color. Maybe I pull my little uh, doodad here, my little graphical view. And I go to the color. So this little swatch book thing looks like a paint swatch book. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pick a color, okay? So go ahead and pick that color. Now what's going on? I can't see my color anywhere. Does anybody know what's going on? I know what's going on. Um, so I'm in highlight. And so I actually need to bring these lights to full. So now I've gone ahead, okay. So I'm about to record this preset. Maybe I'm go start with red because red's a good color to start with. It's the first in the spectrum, okay? 
So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and record this red preset, okay, in my colors tab. Now, the problem you might see, especially if you've come from other consoles, is that I've now selected color, I've selected intensity, I've also selected pan till, okay? Now, I'm in the habit from, you know, my past, uh, always recording a fader with intensity on it before I do this, and then going ahead and, um, and having that fader up so I wouldn't have to activate intensity in the programmer and accidentally get it within my preset. That's not such a problem here. Because when I press record and I press this color, by default, as I mentioned earlier, because somebody asked about this, um, it's only going to record color information. So even though there's other stuff in the programmer, that doesn't record to this preset, okay? Um, now, you can go, and if you're pressing record, and this window pops up, which it always does when you press record, you can select some attributes here. I'll just do it here, intensity, pan, tilt, and color, and record that. I'm just going to break embedded references. We'll talk about that later in a later webinar. And I now have, oh boy, IPC, thinking of old consoles. Anyways, I now have a new button, a new preset that has intensity, position, and color. Now, I recommend most people most of the time don't make presets that have multiple, um, multiple attribute groups in them because ultimately that's just going to confuse you. Unless there's something specific you know you want to do and you want to use that for don't do that, okay? Stick to the, the types that there are because it's gonna make your life less stressful when you can actually remember what is on all your presets, okay? So <laughs> that's my little note there. Um, and so let's go ahead now, press clear twice, and let's make our first cue since we've talked about cues here, okay? So then we'll go and we'll, we'll stop for questions, let you guys check up stuff, check up, catch up, stuff like that. So let's go out here and use our presets to make our cue because that's going to make things faster. It's also going to make updating better as we discussed. So let's take our spots, bring them to full, pan tilt at stage. Now we just click them. See something flashing. Darts, those buggers are bright. We'll take them to half, pop them in a color, which I didn't even name, but it's red. Put them in our position and done. Maybe I grab my wash movers for whatever strange reason, I leave them where they are. I turn them on to 10% and I leave them open, no color, okay? Um, and so then I'm gonna go ahead, press record, press here at the bottom on any of my cues. These are my 10 main faders. There are a few other places to record things, we'll talk about those. And then we'll go ahead and we'll record it. So now we go ahead and we say, uh, give it a name. So we'll just call it uh, red with stage wash, whatever you want to call it. We're just going to press enter at this or click on cue list. There are different types of cue lists and we'll go over those uh, in detail later. But for now, we're going to press that. Press clear twice. Oh no, everything went dark. And now if we double tap on this little guy or ooh, pop up our new cool thing, our new cool fader view and press go we watch that fade in. Let me know when you guys are there. So go ahead and make a little, uh, make a couple presets, make your first cue. Let me know when you're there, okay? Um, I'm gonna riff on something for a second and then answer some questions. Um, so when I saw this come out, I, I wasn't aware that this change was coming uh, in the interface until it showed up in the beta. Um, and when I saw this come out, I said to myself, wow, you know, this is really great because for a while, you know, occasionally on the social media or somewhere else, you see people who think that Onyx is out to get PC users and um, not help them out and make them buy a console. And they couldn't be further from the truth when they go do something like this, right? This is just such proof that they're totally in it for PC users. That's still an important part of the audience. You're still loved. They still love you. And they gave you this, which is an amazing view that you can toggle in and out really quick and easy. Have it there when you need it. Take it away when you're not. It's stinking cool. Awesome. I see a few people getting done there. Grab a sip of tea and then get to some questions. And I hope you're seeing here, guys. You know, we're covering the basics here today. But gosh, I mean, with Onyx, I would say you could go watch the three-hour 
Onyx 101 webinar we did, you know, last year, or even I used to do these one hour webinars or I've got a video series on YouTube on my channel, you guys might be familiar with and you, a lot of people have seen it. And, you know, you can get to building queues in a pretty short amount of time and, and get there quick. But when you spend some more time and start to learn some of the int int intricacies, let's say the word correctly, David, um, you can really find that there's things that are going to make your life a lot easier, that are going to speed you up in the future, spending some time now, so that later, when you go to use the thing, you know how to use it better, and you, you do a better job. And ultimately, honestly, um, whenever I learn, you know, go deep with the console and really learn a lot of the functions well, I always find things that I can learn how to do better and make better shows for my clients, for real, you know? Um, and so, yeah, we got some duns in there, great. Got a couple questions here that I do want to answer, okay? So Octavio said, when I save a position and from that position, I want to start a similar one, how do I activate the position tracking? Because if I start from a ready-made position, all the lights go back to their home. Exactly. Um, for example, I want to record a fan on the front stage and I call that position and I want to record that same one, but above because my tilt values are not respected and sends them home. From there, I go to the new position. All right, Octavio, I'm going to explain this the best that I can from what I understand if you're asking. You can always ask a follow-up question, right? Um, well, Bob would like to answer this question live. I can't mark it. I can't mark it as red anymore. That's okay. Um, appreciate you, Bob. Um, so when we're working with a, a preset we already created, um, the process for it, and hopefully this will answer your question. If it doesn't, let me know. Is I'll go ahead. I, I just selected some lights and highlighted it, right? Put it at the at stage position. And now I want to go somewhere else. Okay. So now I'll go ahead and maybe I do my audience. Okay, there we go. Doing my, oh, I was just there. Do our, we'll find it right there, our audience blinding look. Okay. So I made one position, I'm gonna make the other. If I look in my programmer here, both pan and tilt have values in them for all the lights. That's exactly what we're looking for. And so then we're gonna go back to fixtures and presets, press record and record a new preset. And we're good to go. We can call it audience blinder. And now either one will work uh, independently. Let's just go here to demonstrate at stage where that's in the queue, so it's going there. And we've got blinder, we can go back to that stage. Um, so I'm not totally sure, Octavia, what you're asking there as to why that's that's not working. Um, Richard also noticed he loved the, uh, in capture now, if you're using the CITP to connect them, you can right click on the mouse and it aims the light. What? I know, how crazy is that? It's nuts. It's absolutely the coolest thing ever. I know everybody can say it used to be there in, a, in an older visualizer and an older version of the software. I get that, but it's cool that it's back. It's so helpful uh, if you're using Capture. Um, so Octavia, you give me a little more detail if that didn't answer your question, because I'm having trouble understanding exactly what the problem is. And maybe that, that answered it for you, okay? Um, let's see. So yeah, Tim, uh, you asked this earlier, and I think we covered it well, that, um, if you have a star gobo and maybe you've got two fixtures and the star gobo's in gobo slot two on the first fixture and on the second fixture, it's in gobo slot eight, right? Um, all you would do to work with that is, yeah, just take the first fixture, put it in slot two with the stars gobo, record it to a gobo preset, call it stars gobo or whatever you want. And uh, then you go to fixture eight, you know, you clear in between whatever um, and find the stars gobo, which is in slot eight on that light, you know, put it in focus, whatever, um, and record that, hit the same preset, hit merge when the window pops up, you'll be rocking and rolling. Cool. But he said that was answered already. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Demetrius asks, what about the uh, fade timing? Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about this stuff. Cool. Um, Awesome. George, you're looking for a color picker. You did kind of miss it, but that's okay. So if we select some lights, pull up our attributes here, this side arrow here will bring up the color picker 
and on the bottom, you need to choose the second one here, the little color swatchy things. I know that's a very, uh, it's a very good technical detail. Yeah, so there's that. Let's see, I think we've answered the other questions. So many great questions that we might answer in the next webinar. Um, no, seriously, good stuff here. And we'll, we'll keep uh, answering questions. So what I wanna do, there's some questions about fade times and cues and things like that. And what I want to do is um, show you an example that I think will explain a lot of this stuff and talk about a few other things, okay? And cover a few other concepts that we wanna cover here. So I'm gonna clear twice and uh, then we can go ahead and uh, build a second cue on this same cue. So what happens when you record a cue is unlike a console I'm not gonna name here, is that it builds a queue list. So if that queue has one queue list on it, or that queue list is one queue on it, like we have now, it says one out of one on there, then it's just gonna work where, you know, we, we can hit play all we want all day long. And, you know, it's not gonna move forward. It's just gonna have the same thing going, you know, all day long I can keep hitting play on my console, whatever. You know, it doesn't change, nothing changes because it's only got one queue on it. If we want to expand that to be a, a list that has more cues in it, all we have to do is just record on top of it. So say we go ahead for Q2 and we take our spots to zero. Okay, this is Q2. And then we go ahead and press record. Now this Q list, number 10 here, uh, red with stage wash, that has this box around it, that's the selected Q list. And so I can click on it to record that cue. I can also just hit the enter key because it's selected. Um, you can click on any cue list, but because it's selected, I can hit the enter key. Now we can see down here, it's real small. There's two cues, okay? If I clear twice, I'm in cue one here. I double click to get this to pop up. Boom, I hit it again, I get cue two, okay? Perfect, awesome. Now let's go ahead real quick, just as an example. And let me think about what I want to do here as an example. So now I'm going to go ahead and go back to my first queue. And in this example, I'm going to take the darts and just take them to zero. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and press update. I know we're not going into update deep here. And it says here, Qlis2 is, is in red here, red with stage wash, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just gonna press enter. So what this is doing is it's, it's looking for that particular attribute in those lights that I've selected and worked with in the programmer. And it's saying, okay, out of the cues that are playing right now or presets that are in use, um, what does this apply to? And it's gonna list them right here. And there's only one, so it's in red, it's, it's selected. Now I can just press enter. And something funny happens, and, and this is where we can go over a couple things here, is that if I go forward now to Q2, my lights go out, some of my lights are on, but the darts that were red, that were on before, they're not on anymore. We lost them. Now, if I select those lights and I bring them to full, they're on, they're red, they're pointing in the right direction, but we lost the intensity in that Q list, why? Because tracking, what's tracking? I'm glad you asked. So tracking, hide my command keypad, is what happens in Qlist in uh, most modern lighting consoles. And the best way to explain it is to say, it is what happens when you record a no value, a null value into Qs, and it's gonna both help you and hurt you. What happens in a modern console such as Onyx, uh, most of the modern consoles, is they use what's called tracking. and what this means is if you're going from a previous queue to a future queue in that same queue list, you're going down the line, values are gonna track through from those previous queues. So if I turn lights on in a previous queue and then I keep recording queue lists down, then um, ultimately what's going to happen is that they are going to, um, is they are going to uh, go through. They're gonna keep tracking down um, if it's like an at full value, it's going to keep tracking down until I give it a different value. 
Let's look at a quick example here. So an example of how this works on a, a real basis is say I have four dimmers, four lights, dimmer one, two, three, and four. We just did simple intensity controlled dimmers for uh, simplicity. And then we have cues one and two and three down the left, okay? Now, Q1, 2, and 3 have different values in them. So like if we look just at dimmer 1 here, this is a lot like our example here with the darts. It's at 100% in Q1. It has no value in Q2, and it's at 0 in Q3. Whenever I play back Q2, that dimmer will be at 100%. If I update Q1, if I change that like I did here, I change that to 80%, 0, anything else, that new value is going to track through. So more often than not, tracking is going to help you because within a given, within the same cue list, if you don't tell the light to do something else, the general assumption is that you want it to keep doing what it was doing. That's not just one of the assumptions the console makes in order to save time and, and make things quicker. Because then if this dimmer one tracks through, like say I'm programming along and the, the general philosophy behind this is, okay, I bring the lights into my programmer, I, pro I record Q1. If I'm going to keep working in that same Q list, I don't press clear till I'm moving on to a different Q list, okay? Or if I did press clear, I'm going to go ahead and play that Q back. So I get my Q list to its furthest point before I start doing things in the programmer to make the next Q. So then I can see what it's coming from on stage, right? I make the changes I want to make in the programmer. I record that to a new Q on that Q list everything that I didn't touch tracks through, okay? So that's tracking. And it can be confusing. And usually when you figure it out, when it makes sense is when, uh, the, when the cues do something that you didn't think they were gonna do, right? They do something weird. And you're like, I didn't program that. Well, you did. Um, but ultimately, what we can do with that is, is that's where hopefully what I just said about tracking clicks because I know I didn't learn tracking when it was first explained to me, it made no sense. No, no, I didn't get it. Right. But then I was programming along on some poor show with some poor, uh, you know, artist or something. And the lights, I went to play back a cue and testing or, you know, whatever. And the lights didn't do what I thought they would. And that's when it all clicked. Right. I said, Oh, that's what my boss was talking about. That's what that tracking thing was. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. That makes sense. So that's tracking. It's very important um, that within a cue list, that's always going to happen. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and press record Q1 to get that red back in there. Enter and merge. It's just like merging into other things, but we'll, in the intermediate webinar, we'll go further into that. And so now there've been a few more questions, and this is something that we wanted to cover as well about fade times and things like that. Okay. So I'm going to clear twice. And then I'm going to go to the window on the side here called cue list values. It's number eight in your playbook on the, the left side here. And we're going to change the fade time. So the cue list values here is a window that, um, that um, does uh, something that does a few things for us here. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do, and if you guys can stay, we'll probably go a couple minutes over, um, you know, if you can and answer questions and whatnot. Um, but the cue list values does a couple things. It's actually, this view cue list values is actually two windows. So this guy right here, which is cut off a little bit, is called selected cue list, okay? Um, this guy on the right is called cue list values, okay? Um, and so the difference between the two is selected cue list is okay. This is the, the cue list that has the box around it that we've selected, just like I did there. Cue list values on the right is the contents of the cues we've pressed on. Okay. There's a couple really important things about cue list values before I show you how to change the fade time. I know it's super easy, but we'll get there. If I go to a, a second cue, you know, something that's not the first, I see that a lot of this stuff is grayed out. The stuff that's kind of grayed out, that's what's tracked through. That's what came from the previous queue. The stuff that's uh, more bold, that's crisp, that's not kind of faded back, that stuff that's in the white text is what's actually recorded in the queue. Okay. In either queue, we also see a couple things. It looks a lot like the programmer. 
So we see each type of fixture in our fixture numbers. We see what each light is doing. Now this looks all pretty and nice because we use presets. So it's telling us the actual name of the presets that we've got there. Now we can, we can modify that a little if we need to. Okay, I'm just gonna pop this bigger so I can see the full window. So we can go ahead and hit preset name right here at the top in the corner, upper right corner. And we can do preset number, we can do preset value or the name, okay, those three options. And so that's gonna show us as we toggle that, the different information, which is where it can be really helpful. Like say you're doing a show and you've got a show producer behind you or a actual producer if it's a TV and film type of thing. And they say, hey, where we are right now in this queue, that light over there, what percentage is it at? And you might think I'm crazy if nobody's ever said that to you, but people do this. <laughs> and they wanna know what percentage is that? Okay, it's at 70%, he said. You, you go here, you set it to preset value or you check an output screen, but that's uh, different than what we're gonna do today. You go, okay, okay. It says preset value, awesome. So now you go ahead and you, you call it back to them. They say, okay, you know, take it in half. Then maybe you update the preset, I don't know, but I'm getting off track. So you've got that option. And then if you're in the preset value, you can also see the percentage or the digital number. So the digital number for 8-bit things is zero to 255. And for 16-bit things is zero to apparently 65535. So that's the actual like, you know, coded value to that number. That one I find less useful, but you might have a need for it, right? Uh, most often looking at the preset name works just fine. Uh, the fact that it's teal in the background lets you know it's a preset. If it were a regular value, it would not be teal in the background. It would just have the value as well instead of the name. So you can totally see all of that, okay? Um, then, let's see. Then we got change the fade time. Oh yeah, that's what we're here for. So in our queue list values, we can click around here and look at different things and, and have a nice time doing it. But if we wanna change anything, we do need to toggle it into edit mode and that just protects you from doing accidentally dumb stuff during a show. Um, not that I've ever been there. And so you go ahead and say, I wanna set the fade time for either you know, the first queue or the second. Default on the consoles, two and a half seconds. We could just click there and type a new number in seconds. So maybe I do five seconds. Um, it's also important to know that when we're recording is another time that we could have set the timing there, okay? So the default, and it's in the preferences, you can change it, is two and a half seconds. But you can put that at whatever you want. When we press record, and we're going to record a queue, there's a time right here, okay? We can change that. So we hit that number, and we get all these different options. These are all definable in the preferences. If you want to dig into that, they're in there. Um, for a lot of people, you know, these settings might work fine, but you might want different ones, right? Um, and so you've got that as well. Um, you also can, there was a question that came through about making a preset for fade times, okay? Um, and we're going to go over that in intermediate. That's a little over what we planned for this webinar um, in detail wise, because you can do some crazy nuts stuff with that to be able to set um, different attributes and even different lights to different fade times and make cool sweeps and stuff. Um, but I want to, when I get to that, I want to be able to give it the time it deserves. Um, so we got the fade timing of the queue list. Let me just look over things. Um, again, you know, I feel like a broken record because um, Marcel here is asking about cloning. And here I'm going to say, um, we're going to cover that later. Um, it should be in the videos that I did a few years ago for the console that are on YouTube. So you can find them there in the manual, you know, but we'll go over it as well, but not in this webinar. Um, can you make a preset for fade time for all preset types, Brad says. Actually, Brad, this is a good thing to go over right now. Um, so you're asking about, okay, when Brad here set, clicks a preset, right? He's over here, he takes some lights and he does, and he sends them somewhere, right? He takes them to full zero, whatever. Can we not have that happen like, you know, a little slower so it's not so instant and it looks a little more pleasing to the eye? Can we not do that? Yes, we can. Um, and that brings up a great point. So if I bring up this, this toggle here, my little CV toggle, and I go to rate. So rate is under effects on the right side. Okay. Um, then I can go ahead and I've got four rates here. Now, the one that Brad's asking about, Brad Kellogg here, is that 
asking a time that presets fade in. That's called a lifetime. That's this one right here, okay? So let's bring that one in. So I'm gonna set that just for kicks to five seconds. So it's like incredibly slow. Then I'm gonna take these lights, I'm gonna hit zero, okay? And there they go. They're taking their time. Maybe I switch it again. And this is great if you're running things on the fly, if you wanna punt and change things on the fly. But even, I mean, I, I used to do a lot of corporate shows back when we did shows. And even, you know, you got the client in the room, you're showing them stuff. Like it just looks so much more professional to even have just a one second fade in or a half when they say, hey, can I see this, right? Um, et cetera, you know, you can totally do that, right? Um, and so you can set that timing to whatever you need. There's a couple other timings here that might be helpful to you. Um, you can go to the minimum to take it back to zero. The selected cueless speed is going to, on a percentage basis, change the fade time between cues just for the cueless that's selected, okay? So it's at 100% and my default fade time was two and a half seconds, right? So if I put that to 200%, that's now gonna be 1.25 seconds, right? If I set it to 50%, now instead of two and a half seconds, that's five seconds, anywhere in between. Um, there's also global effect speed that modifies the speed of all your effects and global fade speed. So that's like selected cueless speed. It's the fade time on the cues, but it's for all the cues across the console, anything. So you can hit that minimum, you know, make all the cues snap in. You can take it to maximum, which people use, like you can hit go on three or four different cues and then pop this down to default or minimum and watch them zip in. Um, and so that's the thing you can do. I'm um, kind of a weird, you know, especially with like EDM music, people do that a lot. Um, but, um, but you can modify that as well. When you do move these, you want to remember it, right? Because if you move it later in the day, you might be like, why are all my fades wrong? I mean, gosh, I just said that to two seconds. I counted, it's not two seconds. Why is this thing broken, right? Um, so be careful with that. When you do reboot, it, it does ask you about it. It says, hey, um, you know, you move some of these things. Uh, you want to keep them where they were? Or you want to take them back to the defaults? Grab a quick drink here. Um, and so those are the global times. So the live time, one I use a lot. Um, when I'm, whenever a client's in the room, or even if they're not, like even just a quarter second, you know, it just gives you a smoothness, right? Instead of the lights just jumping. I, I like that. I'm going to leave that on. Um, absolutely. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. So there's other questions in here. Um, Matisse is going to get to those. Some of those just like with some specific preset and timing things. Um, I think you'll find as we get into this and we can answer them in the intermediate or advanced webinars. Um, a lot of the times you're you're used to working in a, a, a different console and that's how it does things. And in Onyx, it's a little bit different, but you can still end up getting the same result on your stage um, just through a different path. Um, and so I do, I do want to note that as well. Awesome. Very cool, very cool, yeah. Okay, so we did tracking. I'm just looking at where we are here. Very cool, because we are getting near the end of this webinar as we know it, but we've covered so much good stuff. We can continue to cover more. Um, so cover cue list values, naming cues. That's one thing I didn't quite notice, note here. So in the cue list values, you gotta be in edit mode. You can name the individual cues and that will show up my window got small. That will show up on this display at the bottom with the number next to it. So you still know what the number of the queue is, but the name can be different. Um, so please do name your cues, you know, based off of what they're doing. So you know when you run your show. Oh, I see what's next. Um, you also can uh, change the, the name of the whole queue list here at the top. Sometimes people have trouble finding that because it's you don't just hit right here and change it. And you, you hit here in the queue list values. Uh, that's to protect you uh, from doing accidental things. And then uh, pre-select for next go is another good one. So that's one where if you're out of edit mode, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're out of edit mode and you hit pre-select for next go, you see this little red box, okay? And the little red box is what it sounds like. It's pre-select for next go. So if you want to jump out of order, like there I went from Q2 to Q2, I know, real exciting. Um, you can have this selected and be careful with it, right? And turn that guy on and then hit the queue you want to jump to. And the console will go straight there from wherever you were, you hit go, it's going to go to there next, okay? And, and so that's really cool because say you're doing like a theatrical type show, like I used to do this thing back when we did shows where 
um, it was a like a music singing competition. It was at a college locally, um, and this production company would would bring me in, and um, and then uh, you know we would jump around cues sometimes in it, and that function worked really well. Um, And so let me just type out chat here. And so that, that was a function we used a lot. It, it helps, you know, if you're in a church situation, um, that's one of those things that, that can definitely help a lot depending on how you do set things up. Awesome. So let's go ahead guys and talk really quickly and we'll cover this deeper uh, in a later webinar about playback types. So we're gonna cover those, let's see when we cover playback types. Um, we should cover those on Thursday, but if we don't make it, we'll definitely get it into advance. Um, so when we go to press record, like say we're in here and we take some lights and we do some stuff with them and we go to record and then we press our button, we get this pop-up and you probably saw this earlier, right? And there are six different fader types in this pop-up. We see cue list, Submaster, chase inhibitive override timecode, and there's actually a seventh called Q Blender that we will go over in the advanced webinar, I'm gonna say. Okay. And each of these uh, types does different things well, and it has different options to them, and they perform in different ways. So depending on where you're coming from, whether you're coming from no console before, uh, you'll see this as a nice shortcut, right? If you're coming from another console, like the aforementioned blue console, um, that's gray now, but um, you know, you may have found that with playbacks, instead of having different types like this, you had a settings window with like a billion settings in it that you would select the settings you want. Well, this is the same thing, just kind of packaged up in a different format, right? You get the same results in the sense that um, you can get it to, to do the things you need um, depending on what console you're coming from, you can ask about particular functions, but do it through these presets and then they'll all have options as well. So just to go over them quickly, QList is um, kind of our standard, this red QList, right? And so what that means is um, there's a few things that are gonna be different between these types, most notably. What happens when we bring the fader up on the default settings up and down? what happens when we press the go button and um, and also how the faders interact with each other when we have multiple faders up, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is, um, what we get, we're gonna do is talk about each type. So a cue list, as I mentioned, getting off track, don't look at the chat, David, um, is, is the type of cue that, um, when we press play, it's gonna fade in all of our different attributes. And we saw this here on the Redwood Stage Wash. We can demo this on the current queue that we had, okay? When I go ahead and I stop this and then I press play once it fades out, it's gonna fade in at the fade in time. And my fader, if I would move it up and down, gives me control over the intensity of the lights, okay? So when I bring the fader up and down, only the intensity is controlled. The color doesn't scale, the pan tilt doesn't scale, um, effects, stuff like that does not scale, only the intensity scales. For a lot of general purpose stuff, this is gonna work great for you, but sometimes you want something else. Okay, next let's go. So let's just take these guys at full, record them into a submaster, okay? A submaster is a little different. A submaster is an HTP type fader. So let me turn this fader. Actually, I'll just bring it down all the way. And so what a submaster does is it gives us a highest takes precedence type control. Now, most faders and most of the attributes in Onyx most of the time are going to operate on what we call latest takes precedence, or as you may have seen it called LTP, okay? And what LTP means is whatever the most recent cue or action that I fired, whatever that is, um, that's gonna be the one that takes the stage, the one that gets the output, the one that wins. With submasters, their HTP or highest takes precedence. And among 
multiple different submasters or a submaster in a queue list, it doesn't matter which one you brought up to full the most recent. If you brought a submaster up to full and then you start touching the intensity on regular queue lists or on other submasters, it's not going to come down to be any less because a submaster is an HTTP type fader. If you worked with uh, older, you know, style consoles that were designed for non-moving lights primarily, you know, theatrical desks, then you might be used to this style of working. Um, also, it's very popular in film and TV um, and very useful there. Okay. Next we've got, so say we take the same, same thing, bring this down and let's grab our spots. Let's take them to full and we'll, we will give them a position of audience blinder. We'll go ahead and record this to a new fader. And we will call this a uh, override fader. That's a good place to go next. And so an override fader is kind of like a hue list, a tiny bit like a submaster, and a lot like its own thing. And what's special about an override is as I bring it up, it's going to fade in everything along the path of that fader. You see that? So whether it be intensity, whether it be pan tilt, whether it be color, I might not have any colors in this queue, but if I did, it would go from, from no color, from just white, to the color at its full saturation at the top. And the override is a fader where I'm able to get that control. And as you can see, it's very useful in a live situation because I can give variable control of any parameter of the light and be able to just modify, just tweak the look on the stage just a little you know, get a little bit less of this color or move this position manually with the fader, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll go over those a little deeper uh, in the next webinar. And then we'll go ahead, take these lights at full, record them as a inhibitive fader, okay? Now an inhibitive fader is subtractive. So if I clear that and I make sure I have this at full, I got no light. No light, what good is that? Well, it would hit an inhibitive fader subtractive. So now if I bring this light up to full 80% wherever, bring this fader up, my inhibitive can take just those lights that I selected, which was just the front light spots, and it's now gonna subtract them, okay? And it's gonna do so in a uh, relative way. So this, this fader's at full, those lights are at full, but if they were at 50, and then I had this at about 50, then the lights would be at about 25%, okay? So it's completely variable. Um, inhibitors are really helpful when you're working with cameras um, because you can be watching the camera if something's being recorded and if something's a little too bright, if it's blowing out too much backlight, too little backlight, whatever, you just move your inhibitor around and, and tweak it to the current feeling on stage and you're able to, to modify it that way, okay? And so that's where I use inhibitors the most. The biggest kicker with inhibitives, it's intensity only, and you gotta make sure it's up, right? If you have that fader down, and then you're like, why are my lights turning on? You know, you can you can hit play on this cue all day long, um, but it's not gonna turn the lights on if there's an inhibitive that's not up. Okay, so it is a master, it's like the grandmaster. You could even make your own grandmaster with an inhibitive um, if you you know wanted it on a, a regular fader, but just make sure it's up if you need the light to output, okay? Next, we'll go ahead, take the light, bring it to full, and record it as a chase. So maybe we do one at full, one at zero. I know I should be using my preset. Record, enter, and then one at 50%, okay? Maybe we'll do the 10th, it's a little easier to see. Record, enter. So now I've made three cues on this chase. Now a chase is kind of what it sounds like, right? It's a chaser function. So it's gonna hop through those cues at the beat selected. What is the selected beat? That's a great question. So we'll, get, we'll, we'll dive deeper into this in a future webinar, but we're able to go ahead and set a BPM here. We also can use the global rate timing and we can tap it with a beat button like on a, on a uh, NX touch or on a F key. Um, and we can store it as different things if we want to, okay? So that's totally doable in the future. There's other settings in there as well. You can make it go in random order, um, et cetera, okay? Next, we've got, just to hit record on something blank, 
we have time code. So that's our last type of figure here besides Q Blender that, again, we don't have the time in today's webinar to go deep into that. Um, and time code is when you're going to be triggering um, that Q list via an external source, um, a time coded source. So when you're going to do this is say you've got a music track or a live band generating time code in Ableton, or you've got a video that's generating time code or something like that to be able to keep everything completely in sync and triggered by the time code. That's what you would use a time code fader for. Um, it's going to work like a regular cue list in general, um, except for the fact that it listens and responds to time code. Okay. And they are that nice uh, magenta E purple. Awesome guys. So those are the basics um, thus far. I know we've covered a lot of things in here. Um, any questions that we've got coming up right now at this part of the webinar? I think a lot of the stuff I'm seeing in here will definitely cover later on. I know that sounds like the broken record of the day is I'm going to cover that later. <laughs> but the truth is, you know, we're trying to cover a lot and cover things deep here, really explain this stuff to you, answer your questions as you have them here. Um, and that means that, um, and don't ask questions twice. Okay, JP, stop that. Um, I know JP, so I don't mind saying that. Um, but questions about the actual material so far. And there's one or two more things I want to show you, but I want to make sure, you know, things are clear for you. Awesome. Thank you. It's very interesting. Okay, cool. I'm going to talk about, since I'm not seeing any uh, new questions come in um, that Matias can't answer. Um, he can answer those really easily. So, um, so the QList directory is one more place we haven't looked yet. And it's the place that all the queue lists go. So before I get to the queue list directory, um, we can copy, move, and delete queue list tiles just like we did presets or groups. Okay. And then just to go over that again, you would hit copy, press the playback, press the new playback. The difference here is that instead of making actual copies of the queue list, um, the queue list is the same. You see, they have the same name at the top here. Okay but they're on different playbacks. Now that may sound subtle and it is subtle, um, but it's important. So if you copy it here, you just have the same queue list, the same queues on two different faders. That can be useful. Not that often that it's useful, but it is sometimes. Um, we can also move, move, press the, the fader, press where you want to go, delete, press the fader, press enter. There's no confirmation. Now I'm gonna go ahead and delete a few of these off my faders. And uh oh, oh no, oops. Oh, bugger. So I just got rid of a fader that I wanted to keep, right? Um, so what happens when you want to keep a fader and you just got rid of it? That's where the QList directory comes in as well as many other things. So the QList directory is where all the QList live. QList don't live on faders inside Onyx. They're triggered by faders, they're played by faders, but they don't live there. Their home where they get cozy and they tuck themselves into bed at night is in the queue list directory. Okay. And so you can always find them here. Um, unless you meaningfully delete queue lists out of here, they'll always be here. So like I just deleted chase six there and I can just go and copy that, press copy, press the chase, press the fader. I've got it back. Okay. It's all there in the queue list directory. It's all there for you. You can move these around if you want. Most people don't. Um, there's some other things you're able to do here, like you can import a CSV style file archive. Um, that's mostly for longer term installations and stuff. Uh, but for the most part, you kind of leave everything in here. It's not often that people really need to purge things out of here. But if you deleted something off of all your faders and buttons and you want to get back, guess what? This is the place to do it. As well as this, um, what we have here is We've got our faders, we talked about our faders already, right? We can press record and press this fader and it puts the cue on the fader. Then we have the buttons on the right. We can flip these, we can record in here. If you have a physical surface in front of you as well, you can always record, hit the button above that fader, hit the physical playback button on that control surface, whether it be an NX4, NX2, NX Touch, NX Wing. Uh, you can just hit the physical button once you hit record. And you can also record playback 
and buttons. So playback buttons are going to be over here. And they record the same way. They're just an on-screen button. So you hit record, hit the button, give it a name, whatever. You got a cue list there. Done. Um, something special about these is uh, you can also copy these from the cue list directory is that you have the ability to set the buttons here for when you press it to be go, pause, release, select. You can also have it pop up the actions. That's what that is. It, it generates this pop up when you click on it to give you all the options or custom, which is definable um, as to what goes on here in the function assignments. Um, so when you press down and when you press up, um, you can set different things there. Um, but um, those are the playback buttons that are available as well. And also, if you are on a, um, a MPlay or an MX4 or an M1 HD or an M1, then your faders on the left, your 12 faders there, and the buttons below it, um, well, on the, the console is the physical, the, you know, the MX4 and the um, M1, M1 HD are on, are on the left on the um, MPlay. It's the main faders, which are the 12. They're also on the left, though. Those guys are called the sub playback faders inside the software. So if you're looking for those, you want to go and find the window. In the examples, it's in the DJ window, I think. Yeah, you can go to the virtual console. You can find them right here on the left. And it is on, oh, the mTouch M play window. It's the bottom half. Those are the sub playbacks. And again, just like the playback buttons versus the playbacks at the bottom versus, um, the uh, the sub playbacks, like they're all just triggers for these cue lists, okay? So I can mute, I can move copy or delete between any of these three. I can move things around from the cue list directory to any one of these three places. I can move things from one place to the other place. All of that works. There's no funny limitations there, okay? Um, and then I think that's where we're gonna wrap up for today. We've covered a lot of great stuff today. It's been really good um, to dive deep with you guys. And I hope, you guys um, dive um, a little bit, uh, come back with us for Intermediate, Advanced, and Dilos because um, we're going to cover so much more stuff. Like there's a couple things that were in the notes for today that we didn't quite get to. That's okay. Um, I would rather uh, cover well than cover, you know, than, than um, skip through some things. Um, a couple parting notes before I answer a couple last questions here are where to find support. So obviously we're doing these four webinars. Um, but there are a few places that you may or may not be interested in that can help you get more info, okay? So the main hub here is obsidiancontrol.com. That's the website for Onyx. And it's going to walk you through. You can see all the products. You can download, get the latest fixture library, visit the manual, go to the YouTube. This is kind of the main hub. Then if you go to the manual, they'll take you to support.obsidiancontrol.com. That's this manual um, that I've had the privilege of being able to, I say privilege, no, it is a privilege of being able to update it the last couple of times. Um, updating a manual is hard work. Let me tell you that, um, but it's good. And um, there's a lot in there, you know, so it's definitely worth a look. If you're looking to do something, there's a search function or you can go through the menus, to find what you need. Then there are the Onyx forums. This is the official support forum. If you're having a problem with the software, if something's not working right, if you want to find the latest beta like this one, Go to the forums. It's at uh, forum.obsidiancontrol.com or just obsidiancontrol.com and find the link on there on the homepage. Then there's also the Facebook group. A lot of you guys came from there, but it's called the Onyx User Group on Facebook. It may or may not have that cover photo anymore. And um, it is a place to just talk about Onyx, ask other people like programming style things, et cetera. Um, if it is a technical question, you think you found a bug or something like that, you do want to use the forums because that's where the developers look and it's where it's searchable and things don't get lost like the Facebook group. Um, and then there's live trainings by Elation here in the US. Not right now, but they will come back someday. And there are a great chance if you like in a webinar, what we're able to cover here in, you know, gosh, nine, 12 hours of webinar. Um, think about two days in person, you get on a console, you can go even deeper. Awesome. So, We'll answer any last few questions here, guys. I'll make sure we're covering this as best as we can, though there are a lot of things um, that we can cover here. 
oh my goodness so Giancarlo posted in here he lost the first 10 minutes because he had to learn English man you are fast maybe I'll try tonight and see if I can learn Italian in 10 minutes um best of luck to me right <laughs> um and so uh yeah I see a couple questions in here let's see if there's any, most of these we're going to cover later in the later webinars. Um, so be aware of that. Um, the general gist of what we're going to cover, just so you guys are aware, is on the intermediate. That's in two days, January 28th. Set your calendars, same time, same place, but on a different day. Um, lots of great info on there. We're going to cover um, effects. We're going to cover uh, going deeper into the 2D plan. We're going to cover the integration with Capture much more deeply and walk through how they import to each other and all kinds of cool stuff. We're gonna do window assignments. So lots of you guys asked about changing the way things look, moving things around, customizing it to your needs. We're gonna cover that really well. Um, you're probably gonna find stuff in there that um, you had no idea was there and might help you a lot. We're gonna cover cloning. Oh, cloning is so good. Um, we're gonna cover some really more advanced stuff on how to select and work with groups of lights so you can make some really com complex selections and do it really quick, okay? Uh, we're gonna cover loading and clearing and then we'll see where we get to in that one. And then for advance, we're going to cover editing things and playback options and uh, networking. Mm, networking, putting delay and fade times on presets, uh, which can be very, very powerful, embedded presets, Move in black, there's been a lot of questions about that lately, Matthias was telling me, and I've seen some of those on the forums and such. Uh, I'm gonna cover some more on effects on that one. Um, MIDI notes and triggering, and uh, what is MIDI? How do we trigger with MIDI? Is MIDI time code the same as MIDI notes? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna cover a lot of stuff, be ready to learn. Is it going to be the same instructor? Yeah, he's pretty terrible, and so, um, yeah, I'm there. Um, but Matias will be here too as well, and probably Bob. Um, no, I honestly don't know, um, but that's okay. And um, we thank you guys so much for being here today. Yeah, There's a couple been... of quick notes here yeah. from uh, from me. So please uh, recheck your, uh, you know, um, capture to Onyx connection. Um, email us at support at obsidiancontrol.com. If you have any specific uh, issues where you need some help, sort it out. I've been doing quite a few people over Facebook chat and through this here. Um, so if you need any assistance setting that up, we'll be happy to help. Bob and I will, we can even remote into your system if you need some assistance there. And yeah, otherwise, thanks David uh, for the first uh, three hours here. We'll went a little longer. We're gonna edit out a bit of that tech support back and forth in the beginning because it isn't really useful um, it, once we post it. So we're going to make some edits to that and then hopefully we get this online uh, quickly. Yeah, and otherwise we'll see you all back uh, same time, same login, same uh, password. I'm really surprised that we had all these password questions because not everyone got that and it's the same link. So I'm not really sure, maybe it's different versions of zoom i'll send like the quick summary email out once more for this but it will uh, all be on the same link same people whether you like them or not first day <laughs> morning same time yep thursday very cool awesome thank you all for uh, hanging here today and uh, yeah we'll hang it up thank you guys thank you all bye, -bye.